Uh, we're live streaming now, and what we'll do now is we will um, start to put the hypertext, uh, the hyperlinks up. We will actually go to the live dashboard, uh, and we will uh, get that uh, restarted because uh, okay. somebody's pouring water, and uh, be careful that somebody doesn't think you're taking a piss. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> aside from that, let me get. Oh that. wait, are we live? No, I'm just kidding. Yes, we are live. <laughs> yes, there we are. Yes, and. Uh, so, uh, okay, and uh, now we will uh, see if we hear an echo. Let me get the... Uh, yes, we are live. Yes, <laughs> okay, there we, we are. An echo. Yes. Good, we got that. And there's some sound in the background where our man, Brendan Zogit, is doing his bit. <laughs> it's, got it's water. It. It's, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, it's, it's that and alcohol and other things that comprise your average drink, right? Yes, of course. Exactly. And, uh, Making a mixer. Yes, there we are. So, I don't know. Um, let me get the share link so I can make these hyperlinks. And then uh, once we do that, we'll kind of more officially be on the air. And um, so we'll get that done as soon as possible. I'm going to do some like moving around. and. Uh, sure, go ahead. And just keep us. I may, I may drop off the call as per usual because of mm -hmm. geography or whatever. Right, right. Yes. So let's the hold. digital fortress that they have around my house. It, mo, digital mo, electronic mo, mo. electronic mo. Yeah. That's the word for it. Yes. Hey, Brendan, uh, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Tice is asking, how did your date with the German lady go? Oh wait, what was that? Hey, Brendan, uh, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Tice in the chat Aaron room Tice was asking, asking how, how did your date with uh, the German lady? Said, Glad you're back. Yeah. How did your date? With the oh German wait, what was that? Go? Hey, Brendan, uh, Aaron, Let me Aaron, Aaron Tice. Tice <laughs> okay, so we got multiple Thanks, echoes. Yes, sorry, that 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 works. Uh, yes. Oh, and by the way, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, well, I told everybody on uh, last time. Yes. Uh, so uh, I mean, you told well, me. Wasn't a date. <laughs> No, it was a, you know, it was like a dinner. Was... Yes, he's breaking up, poor guy. He can't defend himself. He can't defend himself, poor dude. And um, Okay, so let's see now. Is this even up? Okay, why is the promotional banner not even up? Why, why, what is, is this is so weird. Okay, and um, so um, is Brendan with us or is Derek Talley still with us? Okay, so yeah, okay. Okay, good. So at least we've got you. Like he said, he might very well drop because of the electronic moat that's around his home. Now the interesting thing is, I thought that I had put up the promotional banner on the uh, normal page on my uh, um, normal page, and so let's see if it went up at all. And it probably did not, but it did. It did go up. So why is it not showing up on this one? Let's see here. Give me a second here. That's probably Brendan. I heard a lot of oh it didn't go up okay so it got rejected um so let me see if it went up on the other uh two places and uh we may not have a promotional uh banner for the uh regular page so uh we've got it on the other two pages so let's uh okay i'm back now can you guys hear me yes yes thank okay. goodness and, and so we're yeah it wasn't a date it was just like a um just like a dinner you know, like stuff that Europeans do, I guess. Uh huh. And so, any details you can share with us? Um, it was nice. We had like um, we had like uh, kartoffeln mit uh, mit pilze, so like uh, potatoes and uh, oh, shit. mushrooms. <laughs> uh huh. Um, so that was really good. I had like real sauerkraut, like some actual sauerkraut. Like it was freshly made sauerkraut, uh -huh. like hot pot style, you know, like uh -huh. um, because I'm an American, I've only ever had sauerkraut cold, which is apparently not the right way because <laughs> okay. it was actually really good. Wow. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the proper way to do it is like hot, you know, hot stuff. Really? And, uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Which was interesting. Uh -huh. um, there was also some really good, like, uh, because the only European stores out here in our area is like, they're like Russian shops, mm -hmm. but, um, we were, you know, we were able to get good stuff from there. Like we had like, uh, this like Russian cheesecake, uh, type thing. And there was, let me think what else, what, what else was it? That was really good. It was like this, this horseradish beet kind of situation. I don't know like how to explain it. Kind of like a spread kind of like a spread, um, so that was really good. That gave me, you know, I, I actually got to try like real balik. It's called balik disbrot, 
It's basically just a German sandwich. But, um, and Belik des Brot means, um, which I learned this weekend, it means uh, beloved bread. It's like a beloved German dish. They call it like beloved bread, Belik des Brot. And it's, it's basically like an open face sandwich. Like in Germany, the sandwiches are open. It's like, you know, one slice of bread and you stack everything on the one slice. And so that's what, you know, makes it holy shit. Mm-hmm. Interesting. What? Oh, I guess I, uh, I'll let you guys know what's going on in my neighborhood. Oh, okay. Oh, it's some kind of, um, it's like these people like protesting or something over here near mm-hmm. my house. They mm-hmm. look like pretty sketch, but they're saying like reopen California and they have like, they're like selling t-shirts and shit. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to reopen, even though we're already like on schedule for reopening. So I don't know what their point is exactly. <laughs> so it's just a uh, Republican yeah. terrorist, really. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, like that's literally what they look like. Like I hate to say it, but it, it's really. Yeah, it, it's, we might as well be in a state of open civil war at this point. Like, unfortunately. Thank you. Yes, it's it, it, it's yeah. it's so, so true and and so sad. You know, yeah. and they seem to be. I don't know. I mean, obviously it's warranted, but they seem to be really pushing the angle of like police brutality that like just keeps happening for whatever reason uh, like it's just yeah. so it's it's totally anti-state it's basically yeah. anti-authority and anti-state uh is right. is what their their trip is what so. these guys are doing yeah the, the cultists are but like you know um from the german perspective because i watch like uh you know it and i'm not like some kind of german fanatic like i went to dinner with her because it's like i want to learn more german you know like just to make it clear it's not like you know I'm not like a germophile or like Germanophile. a Germanophile. Germanophile yeah. is, 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 yeah, is like, for just like a ra- It's not like irrational. It's like, it's helping me learn, you know, the language of course. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, uh-huh. and, and, uh, so what I'm doing now is I'm editing these and then I'll put the hypertext up. And, uh, then what I'm going to do is of course tag, uh, everybody. And in the meantime, uh, you gentlemen are holding the fort. You're basically going to right. do all the talking. Uh, before Derek Talley starts, because it is Derek Talley's birthday, we're going to introduce Derek oh. Talley and kind of let him... Oh it's God. birthday Eve day, yes. And uh, so he's kind enough to... Uh, happy birthday, Derek. Spend, yes, yes, happy birthday, you. Derek. Yes. And uh, so I've acknowledged that on the promotional banners, uh, so to speak. Nice. You have a May birthday, too. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, you, you're also a May birthday? Yes. yes. Oh, oh, my God. When's your birthday? It's already passed. It was in the middle of the month. Oh, you never told any of us. Why? Why didn't you tell any of us? <laughs> I mean, I just, uh, I'm not really like a birthday person. Okay, I can understand that. And this year it got ruined, so I was like extra salty. So it kind of just didn't really. Oh, you mean because of the wallet? Well, yeah. Well, the wallet was just uh, icing on the cake. Uh-huh. You know. <laughs> uh, uh, oh my so god. So to speak. Is there any other troubles you want to share with us about what happened uh, this year? Well, no. Uh, well, yeah, it's uh, the obvious, you know, like the coronavirus thing. It's like I every year I go to like the Egyptian museum, right, uh-huh. for my birthday. Wait, like, really? Okay. Yes. I and so know. this year it was closed naturally. Uh huh. Okay. So I missed out on that. Wow. And so I'm really salty about that because that's like, it's like the one thing I look forward to where like I can, I can go to the you know Egyptian museum and check it out, and they have like a library there. Mm-hmm of like old like i don't want to call them a cult but like definitely out of print books, is like, this like the rosicrucian egyptian museum yeah it's yeah it's the rosicrucian exactly oh okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, that place is like uh one of my favorites and like yeah they have all kinds of stuff there that like if you know what to look at like you can basically nerd out you know yeah like they actually have a ring that was owned by akhenaten and oh. it's like super obscure and like oh. like it's hard to find in the museum but it's like it's situated in such a way where like they have it on top of like a scroll it's like sealed with a scroll like it's pretty nutty but it's like to the average viewer it's like nothing special but to me it was like holy shit that's like akhenaten's actual ring and they have to like have it like magically sealed and ciphered and shit that's fabulous (laughs) yeah so but that's that's amazing and uh so i didn't get to go this year and i'm kind of you know, it's still salty about that, but at some point it'll reopen, hopefully, and I can actually go. But, yes, yes, you know. understood. Okay, so that's that's touching, and um, yes. so uh, perhaps you could. Uh, I'm getting the hyperlinks up. All three of them are 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 just about up. I have to like pin them to the top now, 
And uh, so uh, give me just a second, people, while I kind of do that. In the meantime, we have these wonderful young gentlemen with us who are going to hold the forward. Derek Talley, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, tell us a bit about your birthday and what it was you had a general overall intention about talking about tonight before Brendan and I kind of uh, explain to people as best as we can what happened. Brendan's going to talk about um, the Russian hacking that, on a lot of YouTube sites. And uh, it will help add some context, and then um, it will probably take us. Uh, I would say that's definitely a factor. Yeah. In what happened? Yeah. And uh, so tell us a bit about that, and and that will perhaps help people appreciate the gravity of the situation. Then we'll turn to Derek, who's a very modest man and very patient with us. And um, I, I, you know, the, the first time I want to emphasize the first time that Derek Talley was on with us, they knocked us off immediately. Uh, the second time we were going to have him on and pretty much announced he was going to uh, be speaking, uh, they, they pretty much, uh, theoretically, they were going to have us uh, off permanently. And uh, this is not YouTube, by the way. This was Google, which owns YouTube, and Google is a defense contractor. This is where the Russian hacking comes in uh, tangentially, uh, but it, it definitely segues into what happened to us and how we were able to get out of it. I'll explain the nuances of that, but um, Derek, Ta I, I mean... Our man Brendan Zogit will present uh, the general situation. Explain to people the general strategic situation of what's going on with that place. Right. So, like, last week, uh, and you can even see it on some of your videos, Douglas, but, like, last week, this, like, big scandal, I guess, broke, or, like, all the YouTubers were talking about it, because, but it had been going on for, like, months, I noticed. And it's, like, every time you post a video, this this bot account or one of these various bot accounts would post a comment on you want to be a, friends yeah yes. a freshly posted video and it will it would always say the same thing you want to be friends yeah and just like one one sentence like something weird like that like one of you know one friend me or something and and over time people realized that every time that happened and if someone were to click on it like unintentionally or just like they were curious the that account would hijack their account and Ha basically hack into it okay you know with that and yeah. take yeah. and take over the account uh -huh. uh, in order to boost its own ratings uh -huh. and the account went by various names like one of them was logan and then what you know it just kept changing like uh you know naturally and and uh it according to these youtubers where i sourced the video from like they were saying uh one of them was saying that like they were getting you know spammed by like russian bots after that mm -hmm. and then they showed the youtuber quote unquote logan or whoever this person that controls the account he was making videos on it and he was basically running a scam where he could show people how to get like a million hits overnight or something you know but the way he was doing it was with all his hijacked accounts you know mm -hmm. and uh he was you know he basically he was russian like you know like it's not just pulling straws like he was definitely some Russian guy, and like mm -hmm. there was obviously hacking involved. So then Google came out and said, "We're gonna basically have everyone do two-step. Um, it's called two-step authentication or two-step verification. You know, uh, where um, when you log in, it's not just a password. You have to like connect it to a phone or another email or some you know something that allows you to uh, you know validate your account." So that's part of what happened t uh, today and like the last couple nights and like that's why um, partially why like the Google is a lot more sensitive than it was before because mm -hmm. uh, they ba they basically had a security breach and like uh, uh -huh. yeah that's that's major security breach it's system wide like a, yeah massive like yeah because like a lot of these accounts that got hacked were people that were making you know Make, li making a living off of their YouTube channels. So, like, right. their accounts got taken over for, like, hours, perhaps days. To know. promote Russian propaganda. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and exactly. So, so the Russian propaganda essentially hijacked the majority of personal media. It's not even... Right. It would be like they hijacked small businesses all over the United States. That yeah, was, exactly. Yeah, right. and, and so it's... Um, uh, incredibly evil, and this is at the level of war that we're at. We're not just a civil right, war. Right, it is, literally is. Yeah, yeah this is econ active economic warfare, and uh, uh, oh, this is truly an attack. Um, so I, um, it's appalling. Is there any other details you can give us of that before I add to some some of my own? Uh, and um, I think that was all I can remember consciously right now. Right. 
And uh, then we had to deal with, of course, uh, this was the kind of technology that was used against uh, Judith Ager, the Grand Madam Judith Ager. Uh, let me know that um, she was attacked by both Pavel Edward uh, Prevara and Agnes right. Maria Schrotzinska again. And what happened was really? she got yes, she got these fuzzy friend requests that were just fuzzy flower uh, photographs, and uh, these were like uh, something that she thought were innocuous friend requests, and uh, clicked on them innocently. And each wow. picture separately that she clicked on, the first fl fuzzy flower picture, the moment she clicked on it convert it to Pavel Edward Prevara in a suit. Like he's trying to show that he made it or something like he had made it in the world. <laughs> and and uh, the, the second one turned into Agnes Maria Schroczynska. And, uh, it, and, and uh, really? yeah, and then they, uh, at the, the moment that that happened, they uh, flooded her uh, uh, computer with viruses that just tore it apart. And uh, so her computer be, became saturated with uh, that which was just unnameable. I mean, flashing pornography, obscenities, uh, obscene images of butchered bodies and uh, the like. Uh, exactly right. what you'd expect from Pavel Provara and Agnes Shrogzinska. A lot of pedophilia, um, dead children murdered in war zones or perhaps in snuff films. And uh, so uh, e everything you would expect. And so she called the computer company because her computer was still under warranty. And uh, the funny thing about this, what makes it so ironic, was her laptop was basically becoming as bad as mine. It was so uh, it basically compromised in terms of its structural integrity. In other words, it had been essentially dropped around uh, a, a few times and, uh, it, you know, it's essentially rendered uh, useless. Uh, and so when she was on with myself, it was really untenable and... Uh, not really trustworthy in its own right and on its way out, but it was still under warranty. And so when she sent nice. it to the uh, computer company, uh, uh, they would have probably said it was the integrity that was compromised and may have contested uh, the need to do anything for her, but it was lost. It was lost in the mail. And so the computer Holy company shit. obligated yeah. felt obligated to send her a brand new computer. So Agnes and Maria Shroczynska got... Judith Ager, a brand spanking new computer. <laughs> and uh, so they sent her, uh, uh, you know, because it was nice. lost in the mail, a brand new computer. Yeah. So. I used to work at UPS. I know what happened to it. Not that specific one, but yeah. I could imagine what happened to it. It's oh, like yeah. shit, shit yeah. would break open all the time and they would like basically like it would get taken to this part of the UPS building where like it would get pieced back together eventually. But like a lot of those probably never made it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, so... Uh, I got you. I got you. Right. And, like, and, and so it's uh, part of the industry, you know. Yeah, it's just an industrial hazard, just common to the industry. So right. that, that, there you have that. So she came out on top on on, on that one, and um, it, it goes. Good, good. Yeah, it goes without saying to say that um, there's some divine intervention in all of this, including right. how we're back on it all tonight. But that brings us back to a man of faith, and that is Derek Talley. And um, so Derek. Um, you know, do share with us everything. Just take the stage and take over, please, by all means. Serious. Derek. <laughs> oh my God. Is he still on the call? God, I hope so. Uh, Derek, is he on the call? Let's let's see where the fuck is. Oh, he's yeah, just he's just muted. Oh uh, yeah. No. We, yeah. We can hear okay, you now. Okay, I just started talking. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. How is everyone? Uh, much the better for uh, very good yes pr provide us a situational update your your health status and take over the stage please by all means oh well, yeah i didn't have really any stories i uh, lined up for today i did the last time but you know today i feel really awful oh, so it's, it's just okay. one of them days where i'm just sitting back watching tv i'm not doing much tomorrow's my birthday i don't have anything big planned you know i usually like to feast have something big on my birthday, but not this year, you know, especially since right. I can't eat to begin with. But um, right. yeah, it's just a it's just a normal chill day. So I want to thank everybody in advance for all the birthday wishes, you know. And um, yeah, I have a uh, doctor's appointment tomorrow for uh, for lymphedema, which it, mm. it, which pretty much grew out my legs. My legs are kind of like puffed up real big, so they, you know, but um. Other than that, uh, um, I don't go back until 
June 22nd is when I take my PET scan. So that's when I'm scheduled to take the final PET scan to see if I'm cancer free. And um, I still feel a little something to where the cancer was. So I actually, I don't really feel like I'm cancer free yet. Something is, something's going on. Something doesn't feel right. So we'll, we'll see. We'll just hope for the best. You know, my wife right. telling me that's part of just maybe it's something that's part of that's part of just healing and stuff. But I've been over the chemotherapy and the um, and the radiation. Hopefully, I don't have to go back to any of that. So we'll see what this is on right. June twenty second when I go for my PET scan. But other than that, I'm doing all right. So how are you guys doing? Well, we 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 we've explained ourselves. No worry about that. Uh, in terms of yourself, I would dare say that I think that what you feel that you're feeling is is fairly psych psychosomatic. That there's a lot of times somebody goes through this, and of course the concerns are that the cancer is not um, completely killed off. Uh, but uh, it, it's really something that you you just and you know this. You can't dwell on it. Of course, you you can't live in. Uh, in morbid uh, obsession on this. Uh, you just uh, live your life until um, you get the second, uh, you know, checkup on this. Uh, that can give us a more of a definitive answer. And as you said, that's June 22nd, you said? Yes. Oh, okay, so that's a while yet. I mean, on your birthday, of course, this happens to a lot of people when they're going through a, uh, a situation like this on their birthday, they wind up, of course, going to the doctor and uh, at least for an appointment. Uh, it, you, you, so the appointment that you're going to tomorrow is how long does that that procedure last? Um, just less than an hour. Okay. Um, I, I'm pretty much getting oh, wow. my legs wrapped up with um, because my legs were kind of like puffing out a little bit, and they, they said that they're saying that's lymphedema, and um, the, I'm pretty much getting my legs wrapped with bandages and and put back to where there's, you know put back to where they're wrapped up and um and all the water's drained out of them mm -hmm. now wow. normally of course this happens to people with heart failure but we've it, went over this before you're in your case it's not because of what what, what exactly was it again as opposed to the chemo the chemotherapy side effect is what they say but then it was because i was it, this actually started when i was so you know when i was b before the cancer before i even started losing weight actually but that was because i was so big that um you know the lymphedema started set you know started setting it in before i even uh got the cancer and you know mm -hmm. when i started looking up what is lymphedema they said that's a side effect of cancer now i always assumed that i had congestive heart failure like you said but then i the last time i went to the hospital they did extensive tests on my heart my heart is uh extremely strong and there is no heart failure or congestive heart failure or anything like that. So um, that I, get, I think that's a that's a uh, that's a mistake most truck drivers made. Uh, they'll see they'll see another truck driver with with swollen ankles, and they say, "Oh, you got congestive heart failure." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. That's yeah, that, that that that's it. You know what I'm saying? They they got a little diagnosis from their doctor, and they. They go around diagnosing everyone else. And... Right, right. They project it on everyone else. You got a hammer in your hand. Everything looks like a nail. Holy shit. So, uh, yes, I, I, well, I'm glad to hear it's not the heart. It, we were over that before, of right. course, and that was not suspected. So tell us, uh, you know, um, obviously you, we had not predicted or projected the horror of what happened. Um, I will go a bit more into that later. Um, the Russian hacking, of course, People can go to all of my videos uh, over the past uh, few weeks, and you're going to see that want to be friends bullshit uh, multiple times stuck up on my videos. I actually responded to it only with hearts, and uh, other people were putting like uh, the uh, you know thumbs up on it and shit because uh, it seemed innocuous enough. But I always knew it was uh, pretty. Uh, bullshit because you know your average person does not talk like that nobody nobody naturally speaks like that uh and and, and uh it, it sounded like some bullshit and i had uh it didn't really especially on the internet it's usually like yeah fuck you or something th thank you that's right suck my dick is usually what you get <laughs> and uh that's it so uh, so i just kind of like uh you know acknowledged it and just went on uh so none of that it, it, that is part of an overall strategic context 
of what yeah. we use to basically get out of this situation, which right. I'll explain more in detail later. And and I did notice that like you you were getting messages like that like in the chat and stuff even before this. So like that's right. The Russian bots were already hitting you. You're trying to. Yes, yes, and they were doing right. so quite aggressively. And right. yeah, so there was the one person who kept saying that, and our they were like, "Can anyone give me Douglas's contact info? Like, I want to be friends with him or something." Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was that. Just yes. be constant. Yes. So. so it was actually more personalized. It was actually more right. personalized, almost like it was. Uh, but um, that was uh, ultimately it was right. that overall strategic cyber assault on 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 the electronic front, the virtual front that enabled us to get out of the situation we were in. And I'll explain that uh, when uh, we have more time. Right now, I just want to give it back to Derek. Uh, Derek will be with us, of course, for as long as he can stand it tonight. And, uh, you know, when Peter Moon comes on, he's only going to be on for a little while, but he'll be coming on around 8. Uh, so I want Derek to kind of totally take over. Now, now we didn't foresee what was going to happen that uh, that basically got my Google account. Now, Google, of course, it's important to remember, is the owner of YouTube. YouTube is subsidiary to Google. Google is, of course, ultimately a defense contractor, just like Boeing or any of these other companies in big trouble right now. Google's not in any trouble like Boeing, and that's what makes it all the more dangerous. It is a defense contractor that's active and still uh, essential and in no way impacted by uh, COVID-19 in the negative. It has it increased its power. Uh, it, it, the virus has been good to Google. I mean, viruses do for each other, right? And so uh, right. Google uh, basically had my account secured, and it was theoretically something that we were never going to get out of. Uh, I will explain how we got out of it uh, the, on Sunday night when we have more time. But for right now, um, we're here. And uh, Derek, uh, because we didn't expect uh, what happened to happen at all, surely you must have prepared stories that you were uh, interested in or things that you found relevant. I mean, you can start, you know, cutting loose with that now. I mean, uh, or were you so totally demotivated because you felt so, so um, blasé and, um, you know, uh, blah, <laughs> that you decided to just kind well, of... You know what, and I did, I did uh, post some stories to my Facebook page, and I also, I had some stories uh, ready to go on Sunday, and I didn't, I, I didn't mess around on Sunday and I uh, fell out and fe fell asleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I went back and listened to the show. I heard you call me a couple of times out, like, uh, Derek, are you there? I said, oh, man, I was out. I was out like a light. Oh, yeah, that's, but uh, that's one, of the, one, of the, one of the stories that I got, charges dismissed against Kenneth Walker, who shot at officers doing execution of a no-knock search warrant. Walker, his boyfriend of Breonna Taylor, was charged with attempted murder of a police officer after he started shooting at officers, executing a no-knock search warrant. And this comes from Louisville, Kentucky. Friday, Commonwealth Attorney uh, Tom Wayne asked the judge to dismiss the case against Kenneth Walker. Walker, boyfriend of Breonna Taylor, was charged with attempted murder of a police officer after he started shooting at officers, executing a no-knock search warrant at Taylor's apartment. WHAS 11 has learned that the charges have been dismissed according to the court document Commonwealth of Kentucky versus Kenneth Walker the second the third uh, dated May 26 2020 a judge dismissed the indictment without prejudice the matter having come before the court on the Commonwealth um, nation has dismissed the indictment herein without prejudice pursuant to RCR 9.64, the parties having been heard and the court being otherwise sufficiently advised is hereby ordered that the motion is granted and the indictment against the defendant is dismissed without prejudice. So hopefully that's the end of that. Now, that leads to uh, what are these no-knock warrants? Police are, are just knocking on people's door. I mean, not knocking on people's doors. They're just going in and uh, with this surprise attack. Um, that's, you know, that, that shouldn't be allowed. And um, I know the police are upset that the charges were, were dropped. But if you think somebody's, this is America. We're allowed to carry guns. We have the Second Amendment. And we think somebody is breaking into our home. We're allowed to defend ourselves. And that's really um, what I see as the, the premise for dismissing charges against Kenneth Walker. Somebody, he felt someone was breaking into his home. 
and they killed his girlfriend. Right. Turns out to be cops on a no knock warrant that that oh. shouldn't even have been there. Right. By the way, I went into some depth about the Breonna case, and uh, my uh, lady, uh, Lena Shea, said that that was the first time she had ever even heard of it because of the media blackout on it. And so she tried to post about it on YouTube, and her comment was censored. So she will go into that on Sunday. But Peter Moon is around now, and I thank you for bringing that story up. We're going to bring him on. We're going to talk a little bit about, um, uh, and, and by the way, did you, uh, we'll, we'll ask you this question when we bring him on. Uh, and uh, so let me uh, let him know that I acknowledge he's here and uh, I will bring him on and we will uh, do our best to see if we stay on bandwidth. Let's hope that breaking up a third person doesn't knock us off bandwidth because we know for a fact that um, the more people are writing on uh, YouTube, uh, I mean Skype, uh, the less uh, the computer, this uh, well, the less my laptop can do. <laughs> so, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is get a new tower with um, what money that I have, a new computer, a PC tower, and we'll we'll take it from there. So, I believe Peter Moon is on with us. Hello, Mr. Moon. Yeah, I think it's going to cut put us on video. Put us on video. Oh. I need to cut that off. Yeah, turn that video off. Because uh, that'll eat uh, up there. I have to like, put the flush. Okay. Uh, yeah, because weirdly okay, I'm seeing. It's off. Yeah, and uh, well, I'm seeing Brendan Zogit now on camera, so uh, he needs yeah, to cut off. Then... Yes. There we go. Yeah, and, and so now I see a full full screen. We got to shut that off, Brendan. That's not me at this time. I think that's you. Okay. Well, there we go. There we are. So, so the uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the Skype, of course, is behaving. Pretty radically, um, Derek Talley. Thank you for uh, being with us, and uh, we, we stay with us. And uh, Peter Moon, of course, it's Derek Talley's birthday Eve day. We're all very lucky uh, to have him with us, uh, considering he's been feeling fairly poorly. Uh, but uh, he's going to be uh, participating maybe more aggressively as the night progresses. But we want to, while you're with us, kind of have you catch us up on uh, some of what you had um, concluded. Uh, in terms of, or speculated, about Alistair Crowley and aspects of the latest transmission and uh, how you were able to contextualize what was said at that point. It's, it's been a nightmare uh, ride for us uh, on this side because of that episode to a great degree. And as you said, we touched some very sensitive nerves and uh, it's not something that, uh, you know, we, we'll follow up on it now because I believe we're as in the clear as we can be considering. But it's, uh, you know, still give people some of your impressions as to why this entire situation uh, became so sensitive. Okay, so we're uh, we're on the air now. Yes. Yeah. We're, okay. Yeah. Well, um, so much has transpired in in the last twenty four hours. Yeah. Uh, apart from you, Douglas. Yes. Yeah, understood. <laughs> apart from you, but it is related to all this, but is correspondent as opposed to. Um, and some of it's actually comes out as, as good news. Um, I think all of this, there was something that occurred before all of this, and you had alerted me to a, and sent to me a YouTube video out of Australia that was allegedly talking about the murder of Michael Aquino. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was a very weird video that was using a fake voice. Uh, the, the Aussie accent would come through it sometimes. But the, the long and short of it, it was about seven or eight minutes, and it was a lot of blah, blah. But at the end, they described Michael Aquino being stabbed in the heart and, and basically falling and then gaining consciousness, looking the guy in the eye and saying, you're not going to get away with this. But uh, these whoever put this together and I think you said it was affiliated with the Q Anon stuff these people were trying to make their own stab and whether Aquino is incapacitated or not they're trying to show themselves as the new Aquino mm-hmm. and okay. for for all of the uh, negative things can be that can be said about Michael Aquino mm-hmm. uh, his acolytes <laughs> are like limp by comparison. Yeah. I don't mean to compliment him, right. but he's far more 
intelligent and effective than any of his acolytes. Yes, which was always a complaint of his. That was always a major dissatisfaction in his life. And uh, one of the reasons why he was so intensely interested in myself. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, a, a fact. And um, so uh, go on, however, with uh, yes. this. And please continue. I, I think that this well, you, you've yet to finish on this. Yes, yes. And, and uh, I had some woman uh, on Facebook writing to me about, because uh, I posted, God, well, I don't even remember what I posted. I posted something about Rorick, it was kind of humorous. It was the, it, it was the it kind of like the in hominem Salvatore, but it was the under the sign conquer in the Latin, which you said. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. the oh. IHS symbol. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I had posted this, and what was so funny about it was that um, this guy described described uh, it was like what was who was the guy? Who, what was the guy testing? Uh, I don't know, but it was there was a qigong joke in there because he was talking about testing his bones. It was it was kind of a very subtle joke, but but anyway, it got it got some response. And this one woman was really wanting to know about Rorik and all this stuff, and she was streaming her consciousness. And she had a lot of insight, but it was a very very sloppy from a scholastic point of view. But she had a lot of stream of consciousness and insights indeed. But okay, this thing that what what fascinated me about this past broadcast and what was kind of hard to grasp i think i uh i think i would have liked more detail mm -hmm. as to you know the specifics of how they went after this golden child but you know mm -hmm. uh you know what did the kid eat for cereal this type of thing i'm being facetious there understood uh, and but you know it would have been maybe but the thing was what was so fascinating about what you said was that um you were doing the whole reason you know about this is because you were uh, exercising your uh, duties as a research librarian on behalf of Michael Aquino, who had asked you for information. Mm -hmm. This was fascinating because he was interested in anything that was antichristic yeah. or Christic, for that matter. Yeah. And that was interesting because you were doing it was like his mission to find this out and you were using your library skills to help him acquire data which was your job right. and, and and this was to, to contextualize that wow it's like this this puts you right in you know center stage so to speak mm -hmm. um, this is like a little bit like uh running being the courier and information collector between Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby, and, and the real assassins. You yes. know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, wow, you're like right in the middle of this and you're you're collecting all the data and it's like, wow. And and, uh, and but then uh, the, the part about Rorick having received the Shintamani stone, yes. it it just reeked. I mean, it, he gets the stone and it's it's got the letters associated with it. it's put together in a package that was obviously not a rank uh, joke. Right. It was put together with a lot of adeptness. Mm -hmm. And it whoever put it together and sent it to him did not seem like, I mean, it just, you know, this is the intuition working and you're seeing like the smacks of somebody who is... Uh, a prankster cubed, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of Aleister Crowley. Now, it, yes. it reeks of something Aleister Crowley would do. Yes. N not to say that he did it. I don't know that he did it. But, and, and, and with Crowley, there's there's a, always a nuance going on. And I don't mean it's, a, it's all negative, mm -hmm. because you cannot separate the Christ from the Antichrist, mm -hmm. and vice versa. You can't separate these things, because it's the sum total of everything. And I will reiterate what I've said in the past, is that, is that I, I could, when I studied some of Aquino's work, I certainly haven't studied all of his work, mm -hmm. but from what I've studied about him and his work and his iterations, I have, and I've even looked at, I could find nothing redeeming in the man. Right. Nothing <laughs> redeeming. Yes. But, then, but then I did find something redeeming, and if it wasn't for him, uh, Douglas wouldn't have become who he is. And, and to me that's a great blessing so in other words he has in his sense in his own unintended way 
if it, maybe it was intended on some level, I find him worthy of like, wow, you you gave rise to Douglas, and Douglas is going to help, you know, give us truth that we wouldn't otherwise find, and the truth sets us free. So thank you, Michael Aquino. You know, right. in, in other words, this this is an aspect. So when you're digging up this energy, and and when we're talking about this, which was kind of an innocent question it was a very great curiosity and of course i know lena was interested in it as, as well and many people were like one of my friends just said wow i never never heard of this one and this is a, we're talking about the the, the tibet or the well, not tibetan but the gobi or mongolian messiah the lama mm -hmm. um yes. and and so this antichrist uh theme mm -hmm. is this see this I realize I've had realizations about where our work is going when, when the uh, Roswell Pacific Theater book is done. Mm -hmm. It the the Presidio book connection has to emphasize this antichristic theme, and it, it can even play into the the Third Reich. Yes, and 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 of course the Lovecraft stuff too. And I'm I'm weak on the Lovecraft stuff. I don't get it all together. I can't put it all together in my own mind. I mean, it's not, it's just a matter of studying it and, and going back over your um, your tapes on the subject. It's, it's like, how does it fit in? Well, it fits in big time. I know that. But I, I haven't, you know, I haven't studied the playbook so that I can bring it into the game, uh, so to speak, and and see what, 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 what to use it, when, when to use it. But so this is a and, and so basically what this whole interaction that we're discussing and we discussed it just a tiny bit personally it, it's apocalyptic we're yes. moving into a consciousness of apocalyptic now ap apocalyptic I will restate is the um, uncovering of calypso apocalypso calypso is the goddess which in Greek means by uh, by fact of Kali Yes. Kali Ipso. Ipso is by fact of Kali, the, the, the goddess. And, and I will say that Greek has a lot of Sanskrit in it. Yes. So that association isn't, isn't far-fetched at all. So it's the uncovering of the goddess, and, and the goddess is, represents all things Babylon and, and tying into... And, and that is actually a rising of the Christ force, um, but when the Christ force rises, so does the Antichrist. It's almost like a, an integration. The positive meets the negative, and it is an opportunity for transcendence. But back to this, this stuff that happened, and it, it created far more of a kerfuffle than I would have ever expected. But it, simultaneous to this, and as I say, I realized where this work is going, is that some very negative uh, I guess what you call negative stuff surfaced and showed itself mm -hmm. and it showed itself it has to do with uh, you know the movie I've been talking about or the whatever it's going to be the series oh yes yeah. and but it was it was very positive mm -hmm. because some very negative energy had surfaced and it was viewed and seen I, and I had, I had this really unusual dream last night, and I, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And and I felt, um, it was uh, I was outside of a court. It was kind of a court where the the prosecutor was um, talking to the defense attorney, mm -hmm. and it was sort of like a traffic court situation. And the the prosecutor or it was more of a district attorney, and he looked like the guy from the Batman movie. I think the guy's name is False Face. Oh. <laughs> Two-Face, yes. Two-Face, yeah. Yes. And, and he was like, it was that same actor. And I, I really haven't watched that from start to finish. It grosses me out too much. I haven't watched that episode, right. but I've seen enough of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and he's and he's like debating with the, with the defender, and like you hold up eight tickets and say, oh, I'll... I'll let you have eight of these tickets if you give me that one, or vice versa. You know, they were they were bartering what tickets they were going to prosecute, mm -hmm. uh, or which which would be they wouldn't present, or they 
they drop and which ones were going to go before the judge. Uh, I did have some limited experience with a uh, traffic ticket I, I got in Brooklyn uh, about five years ago, and I, I, I beat it by using a, an attorney, um, which was great. It was a great joy by using an attorney. But anyway, so, so I'm like, I'm watching these two barter, and I happen to have a camera, not a cell phone camera, but a camera, and I take a picture of them. I say, oh, this is cute. And I'm just taking a picture kind of like, I'm not trying to capture them. Right. And they and, and the, the, the DA guy, the, the two-faced guy sees me and he's like, he's just like, I caught him with his pants down. Like, oh no, <laughs> they're, here they are. They're, they're debating and they're not supposed to be doing this. And this is, so I, I go and see this uh, woman I know who's a court stenographer. She says, oh no, they're not supposed to do that. And then I'm walking around trying to, you know, give this evidence over. And I'm thinking like, oh, maybe I could use this as a, they could get me out of whatever ticket I have, and, you know, but I, I don't have a ticket. So it was like, I, I caught these people with their pants down and it had to do with prosecution. And the only thing I could think is that, that when we were doing this, whatever was said the other night, well, there was also something else said because I talked to my, uh, you know, friend that optioned the movie and I told him, I said, when we deal with Dietrich, I said, I know this is premature. But I said, there's no way you can let somebody have creative control, but he's going to have to have creative control because if he doesn't have creative control, it's not going to, it's, and he, he, he just took the words right out of my mouth. He knew exactly what I was talking about. Yes. In other words, he, he gets it. So in other words, if, if we do your story, uh, you know, it has to be, you know, you can't be, because I mean, there's nobody in Hollywood who will, take say okay uh yeah we'll listen to everything you say and and the reason they don't do that other than it's it's a lot of you know you can't have somebody taking control of the production right it's not good yeah but i said this will have to be the exception and there are things breaking open in his life which were very eye-opening to him as far as negative what he did say was that this uh whole COVID-19 has put a big damper on the child traffickers because they can't traffic at the rate and, and their business and trafficking is hurting big time. <laughs> you, you feel so bad for them. Uh, <laughs> you, of course, that, that, that may be uh, disputable, but we'll, go, go on, please. Yes. This is what he said, yeah. and, and he pointed out to some incidents that he knew about was part of his own revelations, which I won't even go into. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some arrests and whatnot that he was aware of. Uh, that were in the press, but um, yeah. So, so this whole issue of of the of what we were talking about, this is like a concerted effort to jam the Christ energy. Now, I would qualify that because people are very, I guess, what you'd say, uh, riveted and a fixated view of what the the Christic energy, and it's it's really a part of every living thing it's part of the dna mm -hmm. and it, it so in other words it, it's not about some incident that happened in the new testament so many thousands of years ago and it, it's it's about it's about something that is an internal something that gets internalized and externalized in a transformative process inside of an of an individual and it can happen in the consciousness, it can happen in the DNA, and it is a transcendence from this earthly world, uh, and to put it into Kabbalistic terms, from Malkuth up through Dath and into Kether. It's, a, it's an ascension from the bottom tree to the top of the tree, and you could also view it as a harmony between those two realms. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is something that you don't really see. You can see little little snippets of it here and there and but it's 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 harmony it's harmony you, you might see it with the, with the image of the buddha or this type of thing it's different but it's it's so similar because we're talking about enlightenment consciousness so w we hit a real hard chord here when you brought this up and i think particularly when you brought up the fact that you were doing this as research uh because he was so interested in jamming that frequency
mm-hmm. and, and then with this, and it brought the the roaches out of the woodwork. And these this was a, a roach because these these characters that come onto your onto your kitchen table, so to speak, the, you know the Nicole Frolic timeline or that yeah. you know comment thread yeah. and and Pavel. Yeah. These, these this is these are not uh, you know these are not armadillos. They're roaches. Yes. yes. And and so it's it's good that they're only roaches. I mean, they can still like a, a roach can get into your, you know, light switch, and compromise your electricity. They can eat away at the at the wire, whatever, and they can compromise your. That that's happened, you know, some places. Oh, that's that electric box or that electric, you know, conduit has roaches in it. Right. And you got to get roaches out. So that's what these things are, and that's that's a positive. So that's my uh, soliloquy. Yes. Uh, if if if, if that, and well. Back to Rorick. Yes. So yes. Rorick was being set up to, uh, you know, I, I don't know who actually pulled off the execution. I don't know if you even went into that. It, it that was, be- yeah, yeah, it was, it was basically Rorick himself, uh, along with, of course, the men who were with him. In terms of the way he expressed it, it was uh, basically that uh, the blood was drained uh, while the Christ child was alive and non-resisting. Uh, he did not resist uh, their taking him down. Uh, he, uh, basically, it was something that they said was as easy, and they used the analogy of uh, bleeding a stuck pig, because, of course, you don't bleed a lamb. You uh, bleed a pig. And uh, that was essentially why he said what he said, because, of course, the man he was speaking to, the recipient of the information, Henry Wallace, was very much the farm boy. So the uh, analogy, uh, of course, was something that remained in the files, and he gave the word of what had happened to uh, FDR. Now, of course, I pointed out the fact that uh, it was uh, Dr. Drew, the black African-American doctor who looked very white, that had developed the technology by which they transported uh, the blood to the United States. And uh, he had no part, of course, in any knowledge of what had happened. He had just simply developed a technology like someone developing any tool that gets perverted by uh, somebody who takes it and immediately abuses it. Uh, this they didn't have his technology, though, when they brought it over, did they? Uh, they did, because the technology that he worked on, uh, he couldn't patent until 1939, because by 1939, uh, when war had started in Europe, then Americans were mobilizing for war. At that point, everybody said, oh, well, we've got to give this nigger his patent. Uh, the guy had developed the technology uh, years beforehand, and nobody would patent it because he was black. And uh, so, and the funny thing is, if you ever look at his photographs, in this day and age, he doesn't even look black. He doesn't look black to you or I in, in, in this day and age. I've seen his photograph. He, if, if you look a little deeper, you can see it, but yes. not, not at first glance. That's true. You, in this day and age, you'd have to be looking for it. Uh, most people this day and age wouldn't even bother. Uh, it, uh, but in those days, he stood out like like a, how would I say it? My dad had a term for it back uh, in those days that uh, the white trash would use. My father said that they would say something like, he's touched by the tar brush, or uh, as opposed to being black as the ace of spades, which would be another term they would use if somebody looked blacker. Rather, they would say, oh, that guy's touched by the tar brush. So they would say something like that the moment that they saw him. In those days, it would be a thing. In, in other words, he couldn't enter restaurants. Uh, he couldn't like use the restroom that you and I would use, or the uh, or the water fountain. When I say you and I, I'm speaking generically. Obviously, myself being colored would be uh, it would be susceptible to potential judgment in that era. Uh, Asians were so rare; I, they had no real rules for them. But uh, I'm sure they would have been treated like blacks in many areas. Uh, but when it came to uh, the the point about what I made about him, it's important to make this distinction because people are going to, of course, try and attack this by saying, oh, the technology wasn't around until 1939, which is totally bogus. Uh, he had, had had it developed and it was being used for Roosevelt under direct executive order and under extreme security clearances at the national level. And then finally, when war started, then they gave him the, the patent because they needed it in mass production. And there had to be a patent in order to mass produce it. So that made him quote-unquote, theoretically, 
rich, but then you see what happened to him and his death uh, when he was in a car wreck. Uh, nobody gave him a blood transfusion because, of course, they said, oh, well, it's racially segregated. And since blacks aren't allowed to donate, we have no black blood to give you. And so they let him bleed out and die. Uh, the, the horror of, of the world you live in in America is, is literally indescribable. And uh, to try and put this into context, however, that most people, I don't think, really understood. Why is it that, um, I mean, first off, let's put into some perspective what you said. And then um, let's operate on the implications of that. Uh, basically, what uh, Peter Moon said through his own native intelligence was he pretty much came to the conclusion that I was told was fact by Michael Aquino. Now, with all of the people I was talking about, from uh, Mr. Maxwell Knight to William Churchill, Winston Churchill, excuse me, and uh, uh, I brought in Crowley uh, peripherally, but the, the reality is... Uh, Crowley was very involved in this as well. And uh, it's something that I almost forget because remember, I've been spending a lifetime trying to purge my memory of all of this. Uh, when I spoke of it that night, I said how upsetting it was to me and I disappeared for a day, a, a, a full, you know, basically close to 48 hours after that. When I came back from uh, the estate where I spend time with my surrogate son, uh, I basically came home to a crisis that essentially was, in terms of my virtual presence, an existential catastrophe. I had been locked out of my own uh, Google account. And it's important to remember the YouTube is subsidiary to Google. And it's no surprise that this happened because as I explained in depth, uh, fairly in depth on the very transmission which caused this, uh, Google is essentially a defense contractor. It was developed by DARPA. So the connections between the DARPA and Google are um, that they're slave circuiting. They, they, the, the term you would use in terms of a vocabulary word, the term that would be applicable would be a cyclopean link. And uh, so because they're siamized, uh, what had happened, and, and this tangent is necessary, was that uh, my 3D graphics modeler, who of course will always go on name for his personal security, uh, he had basically, as I said, had hacked into the Google uh, system. He had uh, contract work with Google for many years. And when I use the term contract work, uh, people don't understand the, uh, the complexity of contract work in this day and age. If people are older or if people are ignorant, uh, people are simply going to assume contract work, you shouldn't have certain things like security clearances. You shouldn't have certain things that um, a regular worker would have. Okay, all of that is out the window. The postmodern world has done away with that uh, effectively decades ago, as far as I'm concerned. But effectively, uh, when I think back on my experience with the Department of Defense and what we had going on with defense contractors like RAND MIT and all the rest of this shit, okay, those are contract workers. And so if you're talking about people who are employed in a think tank, what are these people hired to discuss? Well, let me tell you something, and you can look this up and verify and vet it yourself. Uh, Rand, MIT, and various other think tanks are contracted to game nuclear fucking war, people. These people have the highest levels of security clearance, and they're fucking contractors. They don't work for the goddamn military. As a matter of fact, the people who game your war games are not military at all. And these people have security clearances that are higher than the President of the United States, who is the Commander-in-Chief of your goddamn military. So, this level of ignorance, I'm just beyond it. I, I'm so frustrated, I don't care to be kind anymore about it. Uh, you people just don't know how your fucking system works. So, as a contractor for Google, my man, the 3D graphics modeler, had the highest level of security clearances. And what they were doing was they were carrot and sticking him they kept promising full employment for him with benefits and insurance. He never got that. He was dragged out for year after year. And what happened was what he kept seeing was this. While they were dragging him along and saying, oh, you'll get full employment someday and getting all the work out of him while he worked his ass off to prove himself. They kept going on these employment campaigns at high schools and then to middle schools. And they would just take the most talented children with the malleable brains who played video games the best, they'd hold job fairs, and they'd basically put them on a line, what they called a uh, rat line, was the term that they used. But it's really just 
what you call a fast track. And they would fast track them into full gainful employment. And that's where all their full gainful employment was, was kids who were raised literally on site the Google campus. So that was the only life they knew. And so he's talking about the overwhelming majority of these kids, of course, were East Asian. And he's no racist. This individual is a wonderful human being who has not a racist bone in his body. But the culture clash was definitely there. He said he couldn't stand standing near them in line in the buffets because just to give people an idea, this is important, Google campuses, they call them campuses. Uh, these complexes have showers, they have gyms, they have buffet cafeterias that are like Las Vegas used to be, where Las Vegas used to be 24 hour a day free food. You just go into a buffet, you'd uh, grab anything you want, you'd eat great food, and then you'd go back to gambling. Uh, this is how gamblers lived. They, they didn't have to pay for the food and all their money went into gambling and they'd eat fairly good food, fairly high quality food at these buffet places in Las Vegas. That's what a Google campus is like. The cafeteria is open 24 fucking hours. You go in there, the showers are open 24 fucking hours. The gyms are open 24 fucking hours. And so what people do is they sleep in the cars outside and then they come back into work. Most people don't even have to pay for home or rent because so long as they work there and they've got the pass, security will check them every once in a while to wake them up in the car, wake them up in their van. So he would sleep in the back of his car and then, you know, he had more of a sedan affair or like an SUV and he'd sleep in the back, go back to work. He could spend months down there. And yet it was the fact they were bringing in all these kids and he said their attitude because they had grown up in the Google system, they'd know nothing else. They were so arrogant, so full of hubris, the buses they'd have to take to go around campus, they would all take the bicycles, the bicycles are free, you take the bicycles off the rack, and you're supposed to put them on the rack in front of the bus so you can get back on the bicycle again when the bus takes you to one of the desti destinations on campus. He said what would happen is the way the kids would stop the bus is that they would throw their bicycle out on the road in front of the bus. Literally just throw the bicycle out on the road, the bus would have to stop, or the bus would crash into the bicycle and cause damage. So they just, uh, after the bus driver stopped, the kid would just get on the bus, and then the bus driver would have to exit the bus, go out and pick up the bicycle and put it on the rack in front of the bus. So he was considered like nothing but a subhuman surf, a Quasimodo figure to all these kids who grew up. And these were kids who were like middle school age, high school age. So this is what he was dealing with, and he finally quit Google. So he had his, he had his own hatred of Google, his own reason to hate Google. So when we hacked into Google to find out why they weren't honoring copyright, which is the holy grail, the sacred law, and why they weren't honoring it with myself, that's when we found out the direct line from the Department of Defense to Google saying anything Douglas Dietrich says is public domain because he's a historical figure. He's the son of Adolf Hitler. So it's as if I were already dead. It, I'm like I'm not alive. Rather, I'm not a creature of humanity, but a creature of history. Now, of course, this will not affect my copyright with anything with Sky Books USA, which is subsidiary to Peter Moon, because then the government would have to come out and formally admit I am the son of Adolf Hitler, which if they do that, they destroy everything they've been trying to suppress. Now, what had happened was our hack was detected and our hack was traced. And so it went back to the account that we used, and despite all of our screens and covers, it went back to my account. And so my account was secured by the federal government, but they did it under United Nations mandate. So when the feds came out and said, this is an enemy transmission, they had to base it on international law in that Taiwan is the enemy state, the sole surviving Axis nation on earth. And since the declaration of war by the United Nations was against Hitlerism, just as in the Napoleonic Wars, World War Zero, the declaration of war was not against France. It was against the person of Napoleon Bonaparte. They, in World War II, with the United Nations, declared all the Axis nations to be embodiments of the Hitler state. So they were declaring war against the person of Adolf Hitler more so than against Italy, Japan, or Germany, or any Axis satellite miners. So that means I am the enemy. And so 
when they secured my account in that regard, the only way we got out of it was to say it was the Russian hacking. It was the Russian bots. My account was hijacked. I had nothing to do with this. And the FBI went for it because the men who were there said, okay, let's not surrender American sovereignty to the United Nations. So they turned it into a national sovereignty issue and said, well, Douglas Dietrich is a United States citizen. This would be like turning over a U.S. soldier to International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, which the Americans would never do. And so if they had honored the U.N. mandate to turn me over to the United Nations, that would have been a breach of American sovereignty. So for that reason, within a 24, 48 hour period, we went from total lockdown and permanent denial forever to our getting back on air tonight. That's how we beat that. So the Russian assault on the United States, which is ongoing and extensive, we were able to take advantage of that wartime situation because the Russians are in a full state of war against you to get me out of being turned over to the United Nations on the basis of the ongoing war against the Thousand Year Reich in exile and the Hitler state as personified in my homeland and heartland of Taiwan, which the United Nations considers me to be the Tokyo Rose for. So at this point in history, when we come back to where we are now, that brings us back to the question of Aleister Crowley and his connection to what happened in the murder of the Christ child with the expedition of Nicholas Rorick into Inner Asia and Inner and Outer Mongolia all the way into Manchuria. And the abduction of a Lama from a sovereign nation state to kill him on behalf of the Allies because look at the people involved. I don't know how many of you out there listening to our latest episode which caused this lockdown as an international security breach in wartime against the Thousand Year Reich in exile in Unterland as represented on the surface world by the Nationalist Republic of China as reestablished on the Hundred Islands of Taiwan. But most of you should have understood that what we had was a situation of the United States with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Henry Wallace, the vice president, at that time only the secretary of agriculture. He was rewarded the vice presidency for the murder of the Christ child and the successful operation of bringing the blood back home to Roosevelt, who thought it would cure him as it did people all over Inner Asia when the Christ child was giving of his blood freely to those who would heal from their blindness, from their disabilities. This individual became the target of the Americans and the Russians simultaneously. So when you had the Russians establish what they said was Red Shambhala, based on the blood of the murder of the Christ child, which would be the edifice on which they would launch their new order. And you had the Americans cooperating with them. Someone had to coordinate. Aleister Crowley was that man who just basically drew in Nicholas Rorick like a chump, strung him out like a fool at the end of a string, had him do the dirty work while Aleister Crowley sat back on his ass and declared himself the Antichrist. What's so bizarre here is that Aleister Crowley was more than physically capable of carrying out this expedition on his own. Aleister Crowley was a master mountain climber, one of the most renowned mountain out of the normal atmosphere of Earth, because on Everest, you don't breathe unless you've got an oxygen tank. And so without the oxygen tanks, Crowley couldn't get any further than the top of some spectacular mountains in Tibet that he did conquer. And where his fellow mountain climbers died, and he cannibalized them by his own admission. He killed them and cannibalized them 
so that he could have enough energy to get back down from the mountains because they were all asphyxiating anyway. But he maintained his energy by gifting himself the oxygen in their blood. And when he came back down as the last man standing, the first thing he reported was, well, none of those bastards are going to make it back because they're inside me now. And so you've got this cannibal Crowley who set Rorick up and he's working on behalf of the British Empire. What was this going on even before 1939? You're talking about the formation of of the big three. Here you have Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt cooperating to kill the Christ child. This is your allies. That's a real alliance of evil. And you fuckers are still out there thinking the Axis is your enemy. But what brought this up? What gave them the clue this child was out there other than all the reports? The Grand Madame, Judith Agri, was recently attacked by Pavel Provara and Agnes Maria Shrotsinska with a friend request attack that was very similar to the you want to be friends, Russbots, the Russo robots that are all over the goddamn internet hijacking everybody's private accounts and businesses. And when they did what they did, they are basically carrying on an attack against her. Why? She really has nothing to do with me anymore other than the fact that she gets $50,000 if I die. She gets my Marine Corps life insurance. She's the beneficiary, the sole beneficiary at 100%. The reason they attack her is because she's Baha'i. She's a follower of the Baha'i faith. The Baha'i faith is a unifying faith of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and Hinduism. And that represents a great threat because by combining and synthesizing all of those religions, this is the same religious convergence convergence of philosophies and prophecies that led to the conclusion that the Christ child was going to appear. In the first half of the 19th century, there was worldwide and fervent expectation that during the 1840s, the return of Christ would take place. That story made the fucking headlines. That was discussed openly and on record. You can look up in the Congress. Did you see 1840s or 1940s? The 1840s was when they okay. originally thought this. Okay. And that was so prevalent. It was openly discussed on record. Anyone in the public and access in the Congress of the United States. And from China and the Middle East to Europe and America. Men of conflicting ideas shared in the expectancy. I mean, scoffers were many, but the enthusiasm was tremendous. And all agreed on the time. 1844. The convergence in prophecy for Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and the Baha'i faith as understood by the average layman, or rather misunderstood. And that's why many people thought that nothing happened or that it was all a dream. Like the Mandela effect, which would be the term we would use today. So, when you look for the solution, what you really have is a thief in the night result as biblically foretold. If you take it on as a murder mystery, the case of the missing millennium in which all mankind finds salvation. Then you realize that all of those assumptions were based on 
a miscommunication of Baha'i prophecy. Christians write books of prophecy in terms of interpretation by the thousands. The Baha'i faith doesn't produce works like that. And so, being the faith that it is, which is not presumptuous, the real manifestation, manifestation that was understood by many followers was the 1930s, when the world would be most direly in need of salvation. And that was when the golden child appeared in Mongolia. And that's when the expedition was immediately established by all three Allied powers. The Russo-American alliance manipulated by the British into the destruction of the Christ child. Which brings us for the whole reason for the war against Japan. Because of the Japanese emperor being descended from the divine bloodline that was infused with the fleeing Israelites from the fall of Israel and their escape ultimately to many places, one of the main places being the islands of Japan, where you had the conversion from the Yayoi to the Joman civilization, the overnight development from Stone Age to Bronze Age with the infusion of the Jewish migrants and the earliest known creation of a Japanese Hebrew dictionary. At that point, it became known that the sacred seals of the Japanese Yamato dynasty from the sacred mirror and sword, the jewels and the necklace, all bear the symbol of the shield of David. It's not a star, it's a shield. The highest orders of Japanese metals bear that shield of David. These were the true people of God that when they prayed for the divine wind and the kamikaze to stop the Mongol invasions, their prayers were answered. The Americans understood them as the chosen people descended from the Jews, infused from those lost tribes of Israel with the Aryan blood from the sunken continent of Mu, that of course is known scientifically today as Zealandia. The correct hyphenation or composite term is Mu Zealandia. But you can look up Zealandia and confirm everything I'm saying about a continent as large as Australia, the only nation in the world that covers an entire continent that is predominantly submerged in the Pacific, that all scientists say must be acknowledged as a full continent, with only the Isles of New Zealand being the highest mountain chains thereof, now above the water, the water line. From there migrated the original Caucasoid tribes to Japan, from where we know the Ainu people or tribes who are not Oriental or Asian, they're Caucasian. The infusion of the true Israelites, the Caucasians, the Aryan peoples in Japan created the culture, the race, that the Americans viewed as the true source of Christianity, along with China, that of course sent out the missionaries that baptized the Christ child and turned him from being simply Jesus in Palestine into the Christ, the anointed, which is a title, not a name. You can't be named Christ anymore, or rather it has no meaning when you're named Christ, any more than if you're named King doesn't make you royalty. When it's anointed as a title or coronated as such, then it has legitimate meaning. It was the Chinese who baptized Jesus and made him the Christ and made him recognized worldwide as the Redeemer, which the Chinese had been expecting. 
His brother carried at least his head to the islands of Japan, where the brother is buried along with what is most likely the skull of Jesus Christ. Because of the Artillica and this history of Christianity, the Americans hated the Japanese, and annihilating the Japanese was the ultimate satanic objective. Their idea was to capture the Artillica of the Amato dynasty, reverse engineer it, and use it towards their own ends. These were the very people who killed the manifestation of the Christ child in the 1930s. This was the whole purpose of the war. This was the whole reason the Americans were constantly on the attack. And they failed. They failed miserably. None of that artillica was ever brought to the United States. If that's not proof the Japanese won the war, then what is? All the sacred relics remain within Japan and no white man has ever seen them. So with that in mind, we have now at least the context so everyone can better understand the enormity of why our last episode triggered what it did. Where did you where did you learn this? Uh, did you learn this in the stuff you read or? It was confirmed by uh, what Aquino was trying to access for his own erudition. But of course, my mother had taught me. But this is something people can uh, research on their own concerning these various aspects. There are practicing Jews in Japan who are ethnically Japanese. They're not people who converted like Jews for Jesus in the past, you know, few hundred years or something. These are people who have been part of Japanese culture for thousands of years. Uh, this is something that is hardly uh, something that is fabricated. Uh, honestly, anybody who studies Japanese culture will find uh, profound evidence uh, for what I'm saying. So it's something that uh, if you look up online, Jews in Japan, you'll find these origins, you'll find these tracings. It's not anything right. that... And <clears throat> yeah, go on. Um, Christ's tomb was... Um, I saw that on NHK, so it's like they're not... You know, they weren't like hiding that at all. You know, like they allowed it they, to be aired. Yes. Yeah, they... they it's in, um, I think, Iwate Prefecture or something like this. Yes. Or Amori you. or something. Yes, yes. You, you have the general idea. I would have to look it right. up myself. Honestly, I hardly ever speak of it, so uh, it's not something that I really retain in my conscious memory. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of the Artillica in Japan, I've gone in depth in the past, and I'll do so again in the near future. Um, it's right. something that, of course, uh, uh, Japan is awash in. And uh, with that, uh, I really appreciate it, Brendan. Brendan does, of course, watch a lot of German and Japanese news, which is deeply appreciated. And uh, he does bring things to my attention that I otherwise uh, usually just wouldn't be aware of because I'm just not paying attention. So uh, it, with that in mind, uh, Brendan, please go on. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if you guys could answer something about um, Aliester Crowley, like either you or Peter, like... Um, but like quickly but also what because it brought it to mind like talking of the artillica there in this in the anime called like Roroni Kenshin it talks about these um these jade artifacts that were created by um Ieyasu Tokugawa yes and they were placed in uh you know inside of Tokyo to create like a feng shui kind of protection circle <clears throat> and um I took those as like you know, they were in the anime, and they actually, um, you can go see those same items, like, in the, you know, the various shrines. Mm -hmm. But um, I found out that the Japanese replaced the jade that was there with, you know, they basically replaced it with a false jade, right. like a golden piece. Yes. So, um, is something like that real? Like, you know, like, or was that just more kind of storytelling? That there were probably... Artillica is like in set up in Tokyo, even until like the Meiji era. But that goes without saying. Uh, all of Japanese right. culture is centered on these artifacts. Uh, and it was saying that Tokyo was set up like specifically in a like feng shui formation. Oh yes, most or certainly. some kind of like geomantic, you know. Uh, all all major Jap Japanese and Chinese, all the Asian capitals were. Yeah. So that's uh, that again. That's that's just a given. Right. Uh, rather. Um, for people who are looking for something more specific, the Makuya people 
M-A-K-U-Y-A is the romanization. Obviously, I can't convey the characters or the ideographs over uh, digital bandwidth without uh, visual aid. But the Makuya peoples of Japan, they are the people who reference the Holy Tabernacle, the portable shrine where God and man encounter per Exodus uh, chapter 29, verses 42 through 43. This is why all of the people of Japan uh, carry those portable shrines that you see in Japan. Right, I was about to say that. Um, Thank you. It, it was mentioned on in my researches. I can't remember where exactly, maybe NHK, but that all those portable shrines are like basically based off of an ark or like it's something similar to that the ark of the covenant yes yeah and mm -hmm. uh it only they carry the local divinities the local kami or exactly. spirit gods and uh they're strikingly similar some of them they're like gilded like all gold you know absolutely yes like visually yes and uh contemporaneous uh to the arrival of the uh the jewish people into japan uh, you had, of course, in 600 through 500 BC. Uh, during that century, uh, you had the coronation of Jumu Tenno, uh, the uh, first emperor of Japan, in 660 BC, uh, per Western chronometry. And it's, of course, uh, the conviction of uh, all Makuya, or Mishkan. That they're named after the Holy Tabernacle. It's just a Japanization of the Hebrew, the Ivriyat word Mishkan, which is the name for the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, there, uh, all of the Jews hmm. in Japan have that name. Uh, so they're, they're referenced by that name as their subculture. They're ethnically Japanese, but they're subculturally, their religion is, Jew, uh, is, is Judaism. And so they're known as the Mishkan people, uh, the Makuya people. And so the triune sacred uh, treasures of the most ancient extant imperial dynasty on earth are Judaic relics bearing the shield of David. Uh, and uh, so when it comes to this fact, the real attack on the Japanese is a Judeophobic attack on the part of America to commit the real Holocaust, the real extermination of God's chosen people, and yet of course, they lay it on their eternal enemy, the Germans, who all Americans are raised to hate pathologically from birth. Uh, the Teutophobia is a American pathology, uh, indeed a Western pathology, of all uh, Brits and Americans who grow up playing video games where they kill Germans. This is like uh, the eternal enemy. And so you have now the combination in the 1930s of the Brits and the Americans and the Russians seeking to kill the Christ child in cooperation as a conspiracy. This is the realization of Erod's own purpose in life, King Erod, who had attempted to kill the first Christ and failed. Uh, yet they succeeded in the 20th century. So this is what we are contending with now. We are truly in the age of Antichrist. If Aleister Crowley initiated this, as Michael Aquino himself insisted to me, and as Peter Moon himself was able to extricate based on his own deductions from what I exposed, then certainly does that not make Aleister Crowley the Antichrist he claimed to be? Certainly he deserves the title. And with that, his British manipulation of both the Russians and the Americans truly make Britain, America, and Russia, the big three of World War II, the Antichrist empires. This is the enemy. It's your eternal enemy. And for that reason, that's what makes myself, as the person who exposes this to you, the greatest threat to the Antichrist order. I would also point out that none of these big three and their civilizations that come uh you know augment them uh are indigenous uh people the english are not indigenous to england that's right the british Isles. the americans are not indigenous to america and the russians are not indigenous to russia that's quite true that's uh, very much the case these are uh invasive populations that have uh, no real roots in the lands they conquered. 
And uh, so uh, our lovely lady, Selena Khan, has uh, just sent a message to myself that I will uh, review. And um, she's uh, uh, bringing forth some of the Baha'i faith's uh, traditions, some of their tenets, uh, in which the Baha'i, of course, have what they call a progressive revelation towards God, or the divinity that's based in Judaism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Babi, and Baha'i. Uh, that's what they feel Baha'i is a synthesis of these various traditions. And so uh, that's why they have come up with such accurate prophecy that was misinterpreted by the laity that were not part of that particular faith. So it explains why there's this determined attack against uh, Judith Ager, because she's an affiliate of mine, goes without saying. But since she's not really affiliated with myself, other than being a beneficiary who gets uh, an influx of money should I die, uh, she really has no other affiliation with myself, certainly in general. She's hardly a regular guest, and really is, uh, for all other intents and purposes, incommunicado. So you have this situation where uh, Pavel Edward Privara and Agnes Maria Shorzynska are attacking her for purely satanic reasons, or rather anti-godly reasons. Uh, Satanism does not do justice to this. This is not really Satanism. This is something far worse. And uh, so uh, um, definitely uh, uh, something to be taken into account. Now, uh, so um, I'm so glad that we were able to speak tonight, of course, and uh, at least show people that uh, we are here. It's at least in defiance to what was the ultimate intent. And in this case, of course, the United Nations was used as a battering ram in terms of uh, trying to suppress myself. In this sense, the anachronistic uh, na neo-nationalism of the United States served us well and at least uh, freed us from uh, what would have been uh, total suppression from the Internet for all intents and purposes. Uh, with that in mind, of course, uh, it is somewhat similar to what happened with Judith Ager, where out of the attack she got a brand new computer out of the deal. And uh, with this, at least, we've got ourselves a... Uh, a, a true uh, vindication, validation, and verification of uh, what we are here for and who I am and uh, what I really represent in the struggle uh, and, of course, what Peter Moon represents as uh, the man who will uh, make my word accessible to the body politic, the general public, yourselves. With that, let's go into the live chat and see what people are saying. I, I think that... Uh, we're very fortunate in uh, the fact that we have 35 people here uh, tonight, and uh, that's uh, nothing representative of the real numbers. As I said, when it's published, it will uh, be far more people with, than that. Uh, Aaron Tice says, this is perhaps the first time this is discussed openly. Groundbreaking information without a doubt. Thank you, Douglas. Well, God bless you, Aaron Tice. God bless you. And, uh, of course, your dear friend, George Knight. And uh, Crystal River is li listening in. She is with us. And she says she can't stay long tonight, but sending good energy. Happy birthday, Mr. Tally. So, uh, uh, by the way, Judith Agard is fascinated with Crystal River and really wants her back on more often. She does listen, and she found the Crystal River episode to be pivotal. And so, honey, um, I hope you hear that. And, uh, you, you know, definitely want you to uh, understand that. Uh, Jameson Reese was saying uh, that uh, he was talking about the Tree of Life and... Uh, Kabbalism, and uh, he was asking, is diabolism a more apropos term in relation to the two stooges? <laughs> uh, he's referring, of course, to uh, what uh, Justin White used to call Boris and Nastasia, or Natasha, Boris and Natasha, the, uh, uh, you know, Paul Provara, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Agnes Shrugzinska. Uh, and uh, actually, no, um, I think that the term to be used would be antitheist, as in anti-theist or anti-god. Uh, antitheist is probably the, the best and most uh, academically applicable term. Uh, and of course, uh, this is uh, beneath and below uh, and beyond satanic and diabolic. Uh, the devils and the demons are part of the cosmological ecology. Uh, the anti-gods are, are not. Uh, and uh, what... Uh, uh, the diabolic represents is human faults and failings. 
and vulnerabilities. Uh, the anti-gods are dealing with something well beyond that. And uh, so uh, some people have been arguing over Q and, uh, uh, and saying that, it, and some are pointing out that Michael Aquino is Q, of course. And um, so all of that is, is very welcome. I want to thank everybody for this. And I want to thank Derek Talley, of course, for spending his birthday with us. So, of course, um, we're headed towards close to midnight, at least, where um, uh, Mr. Peter Moon is. I um, will invite him to join us on Sunday, where we're going to go more in depth on some of these subjects and cover some others. But uh, he certainly uh, did his part tonight. And um, if he's busy Sunday, that's okay, too. I mean, we, we've got plenty to catch up on. And, yeah, uh, I can, I can, I can come back Sunday, and I, I want to just the one other thing I wanted to say was that all this stuff, a lot has been coming up. I, I um, on the actual geography and of Russia yeah. before it was Russia, and it, it was uh, my friend was getting very excited about the fact that he'd never heard that there was an entire nation. That the Czar, and I'm not sure which Czar it was, went in in the 1800s and completely obliterated the nation of what what is known on European map, old European maps, as Tartaria, yes. representing uh, the Tartars. And yes. there was a whole nation there that was basically, literally, uh, wiped out. The cities looked like everybody was inside because they had COVID-19. But we're going back 150 years or so. Yes, I mean, and, is, and this, yeah. this oh. is unknown history that has been suppressed or just not brought up, and it's now it's starting to come up. Yes, yes, and and this is Yeah, yes, not right. Yes, in, in other words, what uh, Peter Moon is uh, addressing is the fact that, of course, uh, Russia imposed itself over a vast amount of ethnicities. Uh, it's very similar to the American imposition of itself uh, via annihilation of what must be hundreds of Indian nations and tribes throughout North America. When you really go into the amount of First Nations, as the Canadians reference the Indian peoples, uh, the amount that uh, were annihilated, uh, many of them forever from history, is, of course, immense. We are speaking in terms of nations. We're speaking in terms of hundreds. When it comes to people, ultimately, all the way from the North Pole to the South Pole, uh, we are speaking of, of course, millions, and ultimately a uh, hundred million throughout the Western Hemisphere. When we include the Caribbean nations, uh, many of the native populations that were wiped out, Russia did all of that within the vastnesses of Eurasia, Inner Asia and Cyber Asia. There were um, the Turkish people today uh, are adhering towards Pan Turkism, and uh, the Turkish ethnicities uh, stretch into Cyber Asia all the way to the North Pole, uh, literally towards the Arctic Sea, I mean to say, towards uh, the New Siberian Islands. Uh, all of this is ethnically Turkic people. Caucasian peoples who were overrun by the Slavs. And the Slavs are a hybridized race descended from the Vikinger, or the Vikings who had settled inland rather than becoming seafaring. They became river pirates and essentially invaded uh, the inner interior of uh, that which was outside of Europe to establish what became the Eurasian nation of Russia. And uh, remember that the original Russia, the original uh, source of all Russian culture, was the Ukraine. The original capital of Russia was in Kiev. And uh, this was, of course, Kievan Rus. And Kievan Rus was the first Russia. And it is hated and despised by the new Russians. And the new Russians are the hybrids of the real Russians and the Viking raiders. And these neo-Slavs, these kind of Slavic, as in Slavic and Jew, Slavic or Vikingized Russians, they made Moscovy, the state of Moscow, into Russia as Westerners comprehend it today. And 
they have uh, tried to annihilate the original Russian culture in Ukraine, the Ukraine, even so far as to giving it the name rather than Kievan Rus or original Russia or old Russia, they give it the name Ukraine, which simply means borderland. So they've done their best to peripheralize it, just as the Mongols referred to China as Mingcheng, or the borderlands of the Mongols, rather than as the ancient culture, infinitely richer and more complex than theirs, that it actually was. So the Russians have done the same with what they've done to, with the marginalization and peripheralization of Ukraine, which the overwhelming majority of Americans don't support, turning instead to support the Russians as they did in World War II. Now, every time the Americans have cooperated and aligned with Russia, it's led to worldwide catastrophe. It happened with uh, the individual, of course, who we spoke of in our latest transmission with Peter Moon prior to this one, when uh, we speak of uh, the Imperial Cruise, the book, it was written by the man who, of course, wrote the book Flags of Our Fathers. And uh, so if you look up the book Imperial Cruise, because this is the guy who actually asked to consult with myself when he was writing the book, James Bradley. When you take a look at James Bradley's book, The Imperial Cruise, this turned him from being a patriotic hero for writing the book Flags of Our Fathers about his father contextualized amidst the history of World War II at that time, particularly the Battle of Iwo Jima being one of the flag raisers on Iwo Jima. And therefore, everybody was saying, oh, this guy's the greatest to his being a race traitor and a, a subversive uh, son of a bitch. Uh, everybody hates him for what the book he wrote after consulting with myself, in which his book, The Imperial Cruise, is subtitled A Secret History of Empire, talking about how the Americans started World War II back in World War I, or the precursor to World War I, the Russo-Japanese War, during which that time you had the queasy side of Theodore Roosevelt, the Republican Roosevelt's uh, machinations, resulting in, of course, a war that would ultimately be a genocidal conflict. I mean, James Bradley's book about Theodore Roosevelt is not really packed with secrets. Much of the material it discusses has always been hidden in plain sight, and that's what I taught him. But Roosevelt biographers of the Republican Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, from who we get the fucking teddy bears because of all the bears he fucking killed, then people used to take the bear skins, and some of them had the idea, well, let's put some stuffing in it and give it to the kids to play with. That's how you had the origins of fucking teddy bears. That's how they got his name. And without mentioning shit like that, Roosevelt biographers subscribe to orthodoxies. And one of them is that when Roosevelt made noxiously racist and ethnocentric remarks about Anglo-Saxon greatness, so what? He was just voicing the tenets of his tone. I mean, Douglas Brinkley wrote a thousand-page propaganda piece called Wilderness Warrior, which was published in 2009 about Theodore Rose Roosevelt saying, oh, nationalistic boasting was in fashion. But Mr. Bradley, who had writ The Flags of Our Fathers, after speaking to myself, refused to simply cite Roosevelt's egregious talk. He presented the completely ignored aspect of Roosevelt's thinking after long discussions with myself telephonically with sharp specificity based upon my insights from working with Michael Aquino and dealing with records not available to the public. And yet all circumstantial evidence is there to validate everything I've said. In 1906, Roosevelt wrote, I am so angry with that infernal little Cuban Republic that I would like to wipe its people off the face of the earth. And then goes on to make a much more damaging point, angrily and even persuasively connecting Roosevelt's race-based foreign policy on miscalculations into a perspective 
where only the Anglo-Saxon race would remain surviving on the surface of the world. And for that reason, when Mr. Bradley wrote about Roosevelt, he expressed in the Imperial Cruise all of the miscalculations that were resultant in Asia. And his thesis in the Imperial Cruise is startling enough to all the American ignorant to reshape all conventional wisdom about Roosevelt's presidency. And to quote us from his book, which in turn he was basically off times quoting from myself, here was the match that lit the fuse, and yet for decades we paid attention only to the dynamite. The flame to which he refers is Roosevelt's secret diplomacy with Japan. And of course, he was someone who took the side of the Russians to deprive Japan of any spoils from their winning the Russo-Japanese War. He was the man who came in so that the Japanese won the war, but lost the peace. And so, when you had Theodore Roosevelt acting on behalf of the Russians as the white people of the world, so that he could uh, contain the Japanese, who were errant, upstart, yellow niggers, this made World War II inevitable. And then you had Woodrow Wilson siding with the Russians in World War I. And that guaranteed, in terms of its outcome, after the American deployment of the most deadly weapon, the most lethal weapon in all of human history, the American flu, which became, of course, the Spanish flu, in propagandistic revisionism. Then you had 200 million people die worldwide in annihilation of a good third of the human population on the surface of the world at that time. And then you wound up with a guarantee for World War II. Because the National Socialists what the Americans deride as the Nazis, never forgot nor forgave. And with World War II, the Americans and the Russians sided again. And now the absolute majority of Americans want to side with Russia again. The American-Russian alliance, along with the British in between, has brought nothing but catastrophic war after war to the world. They seek to destroy all life in the end. These are the empires of the anti-gods. You are in their world right now. If you continue to tolerate their dominance of the earth, there won't be an earth left for your children's children to inherit. For that reason, you have to understand the Axis powers were on the side of the true descendants of the Israelites, the Japanese. And, of course, the Germans who have been fighting the Anglo-American Slavic threat forever. This war is now not only in your backyard, it's in your computer, it's in your mind. Because all the QAnon propaganda that's vomited from everyone's mouth in this day and age, from their quote-unquote own research, just all the crap they find on QAnon. Now, I'm not quite sure I have the energy tonight. We came on just to show we're here. May not go into depth in that tonight. We'll figure it out after we dedicate some more time to Derek and Brendan. I'm going to send Mr. Peter Moon off to bed and ask him to share our... I appreciate that, and I'll see you on Sunday. I look forward to it, and it'll be at the regular time. And uh, do give our love to Paula, and um, you have a blessed blessed night. Okay, thank you very much. Good night. Good night, Peter. Good night. So... um,
very much appreciate his input. Um, Derek, are you still with us? Yes, yes. Oh, wonderful. Um, please, go on with some of the other stories that you were going to bring up uh, the other night. And um, do what you can to keep us occupied. And Brendan, I want you to participate with him. And I want both of you gentlemen to uh, um, speak of things to keep uh, the bandwidth burning for now. And uh, Brendan, maybe you could tell people a bit about the link you had just sent me and why you feel that that's uh, important and what it exposes. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I don't know if you've heard of this, but um, there was another article I found about the, the guy that runs or that leads that group. And it's basically this group in Germany. Um, let me pull up the name again. What is it? Reichsburger. Mm -hmm. And basically, the, it's this guy that created his own kingdom. And he claims um, rightful airship to Germany as a kingdom. And so he was able to, like, launder money. Or this is how they're spending it. But who knows, actually, because it seems pretty criminal. But anyways, he um, he was able to, like, print passports and amass money and he basically has this compound in um a place called v Württemberg mm -hmm. or something like that in germany mm -hmm. and uh yeah he he claimed he's been fighting the german government over various like legal legal things but he has his own kingdom or he claims his own kingdom under deutsches reich mm -hmm. which um yeah i was just curious it's called reichsburger and i was wondering what like you know if you would look into it at some point and maybe see like what's up with this guy, but overall it just seems kind of interesting. Like, um, you know, are there people in Germany that are related to like the early, like Phil Helms and various Kings? Um, cause I remember you saying that they were living in the United States. So I, yeah. this guy could just be, you know, what was that? I, I was just going to say, with uh, the amount of sex that the people in power had, I mean, uh, right. we're all kind of related a little bit to the uh, uh, various Absolutely. monarchies and aristocracies. I say that uh, right. sarcastically, of course, but uh, honestly, uh, you know, I mean, right. they got knows, relations. Yeah. yeah, they got relations everywhere. Uh, all right. these royal families. So go on. Yeah. And yeah, when I find the other article again, I will um, give more detail. But like, that's just it just seemed interesting. And then. Because uh, that article wasn't a Deutsche Welle article, and in Deutsche Welle, it's labeling them as a like rightist group, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and from what I, the other article didn't really make him seem political, other than he was opposed to like the German government. Uh -huh. So like you know, so they which obviously is political. Yeah, yeah, it's political, but it doesn't it doesn't mean like it's right, right. wing or left wing. It's just uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so uh, but they classified. they had to shut him down because he was able to use his passport like legally somehow. He, like, found a loophole, like, in international law or something. It, so it sounds like uh, Sean David Morton. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, like, uh, was that the guy that made his own kingdom or something? Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we, we, yeah Sean, exactly. Sean, Sean David Morton. So, yeah. So there are, like, German factions that do that, too, and so that was just interesting to bring up. Uh-huh. And, 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 of course, the uh, the German factions are, you know, they're, they're doing their own thing. But, you know, also Peter right. Moon was under the impression that uh, Sean David Morton was going to get out. Uh, but you know, Peter Moon was sourcing um, this this doofus who was named um, who's the guy? Uh, he, he claims he's an Asian expert, um, Benjamin Falford. And um, so um, I'm not quite sure if Peter Moon is aware of just how much of a doofus Benjamin Falford is, but he's got no street cred. <laughs> so I don't oh. think that I, I don't know about Sean David Morton getting out anytime soon. But, you know, it's, right. it's not something I'm really interested in uh, enough to even uh, follow up on. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, you know, just, just just pointing that out there so people understand right. that. So, um, yeah, um, there so, were a, yeah. Yeah. there were a couple other headlines like. Um, that were pretty alarming to me at least um and it all kind of ties in because like that the hong kong law that was just passed is like a big controversy obviously but um at the same time apparently and this is only reported in the german news as far as i could see right now um that that lady that they're holding in canada um meng wen mm -hmm. um of, of huawei mm -hmm. um apparently she lost her court battles and she's facing basically being deported to the u.s at this point and so things could get a little bit more hairy you know mm -hmm. between us and china if that actually does happen i think right right not even to take into account the the shenanigans that's happening in hong kong and um i sent you that other article from the german uh he was an opinion article 
writer on Deutsche Welle. His name is uh, Alexander Gorlash. And he was saying Hong Kong is lost. This is like his opinion, but he's saying if this is the, what is it, like the subtitle, if China doesn't face consequences, a military attack on Taiwan, it's only a matter of time, says this guy, you know, Gorla. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, so um, I mean, certainly his stance is appreciated. It's one of those stances where right. he's he's exercising extreme caution, and what he's saying is right. that uh, is is common sense from a kind of uh, political perspective. In that, um, uh, obviously, you want to because like, stand, uh, you know. am I getting it right? Like, because if China does that to Hong Kong, and they actually they basically have um, admitted to removing the two state system or what you know what was it yes it's a Um, one nation two two systems yeah two systems one nation yeah so they've effectively like admitted to removing that for hong kong at this point or they're in the process of doing so so i think like i guess that makes sense like the next thing would be taiwan you know but well that would embolden them because they think of taiwan as of course part of china and so right. it would embolden them. That's what his warning is. Okay, mm-hmm. and of course uh, that doesn't mean at all they would succeed. Uh, these people right. say right. that as if there's a you know, and I, I don't mind they're doing that. I don't mind they're they're saying this as if that America has to intervene because of course I would prefer America to intervene. Uh, that goes right. without saying. And uh, so uh, it, at any rate, uh, and if America does. Uh, uh intervene then uh i would say um uh good <laughs> right. you know it's uh, one of those things that uh, uh at least with there's the, definitely uh, a lot of back and forth and like yeah. pompeo was saying that um it like hong kong has lost its high decree of autonomy and they're going to remove the special status economic zone mm-hmm. that it has so like all of this isn't voting well let me say that and, uh, uh, well, in, in a sense, it's not boding well. In another sense, it, it, it bodes well enough. I mean, right. it, it's kind of like, uh, you, you know, it's um, one of those situations where the Democrats will inherit this. They're going to inherit the stance. They're going to inherit the national stance. Right. So in that sense, uh, this is good for my people. And uh, of course, I have yes. their, their interests at heart. Um, and it's something that I encourage and uh ultimately um we take it from there you know everything is just uh you kind of take it as it comes and you work with it and uh you know i've done my best to uh make a positive of various negative things that have happened and uh you know hopefully it works out judith agard style where you know uh you come out of an attack with a brand new computer and (laughs) in my case you know uh hopefully uh we get what we were looking for uh to extent so uh at any rate, thank you for and, that. And um, yeah, by all means, and, uh, Derek, um, please, uh, you know, join us in now more aggressively. I mean, I, I feel so bad. I mean, are, you're not intimidated or, or you feel like you need to kind of just uh, bow out. I, I know it's simply because morally, more or less you're not feeling that well, that you're not, you know, interjecting yourself that much, right? Right, right, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm listening, but um, I'm here. I got some stories lined up. And, please, and, um, take over. Take yeah. over. All right. Well, one story that I have, uh, it was revealed white cop who, ne- who knelt on George Floyd's neck was involved in a fatal police shooting. And one of the other fired officers paid a twenty five thousand dollar settlement after being sued using excessive force and arrest where he punched and kicked a handcuffed suspect. So uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of this Ger- George Floyd Um murder that took place where the cop knelt in his neck for eight minutes have you guys are you guys familiar with that story uh, right. uh yeah i've heard about it just recently yeah it was just today i i, I heard about it uh, yeah I, yeah go on i'm sorry <laughs> yeah i seen the video of it the video was like painful to watch i mean right now yeah. to me it's almost just like like um like snuff films just to watch all these murders of 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 you know, black citizens. It's like it's like snuff films. It's like porn. Like, right. Like, why did they show yeah. them on TV? Is my question. It's like they don't show anything else like that. You know, like they censor like even animals getting killed. It's kind of like weird. You know, I, well, I guess to bring the point across of like the brutality, that makes sense. But. Yeah. In a, in a sense, you have to, or people are just not going to believe it. 
that's that's the problem right right uh, you know if it's kind of like they're stuck in that situation yeah and, and 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 so it has to be shown uh so i i am uh right. glad that they're that they're showing it so uh um please uh yeah go on uh and 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 so with, with this what where do we go from here uh now that this is out and and people hopefully are outraged uh so so where do we go with this uh well, right now we're just at the at the point. Uh, here's some facts, you know, for people not familiar with the case. Uh, Derek Chauvin, spelled C H A U V I N. That's the um, name of the officer that actually knelt on his his neck. Derek spelled just just like my name, D E R E K. Yeah, Derek Chauvin, 44. The officer filmed kneeling on Floyd's neck for eight minutes is a 19-year veteran of the force. You know what? If I was if, if I was on the police force for 19 years, I would I would just play it safe for one more year and retire. Yes. What thank the hell? You. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, what the fuck? Is, but you know, with these guys, what happens is it goes to their heads that they can act with total impunity, and they're trying to have quote unquote as much fun as they can. Uh, before they, uh, you know, uh, go off into the sunset. Uh, you know, once they retire, they're not going to have this much fun beating blacks up again. So, <laughs> right, right, uh, and yeah, and once you get in your forties, don't you kind of calm down a little bit? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a, he was investigated in 2006 over a fatal police shooting, and again in 2008 and in 2011 for two more shootings. So he, every every four years, this this little punk bucks up and and they have to investigate him, but yet they won't fire him. Okay, a second officer involved in Monday's arrest, and his name um, is To Tayu, T O U is his first name. His last name is T H A O. He was sued in 2017 for using excessive force. Uh, the lawsuit obtained by DailyMail.com accuses him of punching and kicking a handcuffed suspect. George Floyd died Monday in police custody hours after footage showed cop uh, Chavin knelt on him knelt on him for eight minutes during the forgery arrest in Minneapolis for four officers involved in Monday's incident were fired. CBS Minnesota named the remaining two officers as Thomas Lane and J. Alexander Kurig, or Kurig. Well, anyway, George Floyd, uh, he was, he's part, he's, he's actually from Houston, Texas. And from what I understand, he's part of the Christian hip hop community. Okay. And the reason for, <laughs> for, the reason for his arrest, it was, uh, they were, he was in a grocery store and I guess he had a check that was signed and they didn't confirm that whoever signed the check would sign the check. So now they're calling a forgery arrest, but we really don't even know if it was a true forgery or whether he just didn't prove that the, whoever signed the check was supposed to sign the check. I don't know. It wasn't his check. You know what I'm saying? Someone, <laughs> signed, someone He was out of state and someone sent him to the grocery store with a signed check, you know? Oh, my God. So, uh, it, yeah, so, I mean, but it, that's not a violent... I mean, if it was... Even if it was a forged check, that's not a violent crime because then I posted another story earlier that says uh, there's footage of him being handcuffed, being fully compliant. Mm -hmm. So how did he end up on the ground with the cop's neck, knee on his neck for eight minutes when they arrested him? And there's footage of him being arrested in handcuffs and him and the cop are perfectly calm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 bizarre. It, it's one of those things where um, it, you know it's like the footage that was provided to us of this uh, uh, woman who was arrested, a blonde uh, white woman who was arrested by the police, and uh, you know this one asshole got uh, a, a cop, a veteran cop of many years, uh, got alone with her and beat her half to death, you know, and on camera. And he just got fired when, you know, if you and I beat up a woman that way, we'd be in jail for 10 to 15 years. Uh, right. Yeah. So this is uh, beyond offensive. It, it is. It, it's it's, you know, just crap. <laughs> it's, it's just crap. Uh, so uh, 
Anyhow, uh, definitely one of those things where I'm, uh, you know, thank you for bringing that up. It's an important point. And please, uh, by all means, uh, bring up more. Go on with uh, what else is on your mind and, uh, you know, keep us going for a while. And I'll have our man Brendan kind of interject where he feels, you know, it, it'll be constructive to do so. Then I'll decide whether I want to speak at all tonight. Uh, with everything that we did to even get online at all, I think that, you know, I think we did well, considering. And then uh, we could make this one of the shortest episodes ever. Uh, of, uh, But definitely, I'm so glad we got on it all for your birthday. And um, uh, before you go into any stories, tell us a little bit about... Uh, uh, I, I, I guess there's no use in asking you your plans for this year, in a sense, because right now, with everything up in the air, with everything kind of up in the air with COVID-19, uh, as well as I, I think we're going to wait till June 22nd before we establish any plans beyond, you know, just uh, till that point, uh, I, I guess. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, in a general sense, your family is doing OK. Oh, yeah, my family's doing fine. Uh, we didn't do much for Labor for Memorial Day, and um, you know Memorial Day is usually a big deal for us. Especially when I was in in Chicago, we were always having a barbecue of some sort, and you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of my family members that were keeping the family members together by always throwing events, members aren't around anymore, and us younger folks have kind of just gone their own way, you know, which. Uh, if I had the money, I would go to Chicago every year and um, just throw a barbecue and, and make sure everybody's together. Because, you know, a lot of these babies that I knew as babies now are starting to get grown and some of them are starting to turn to teenagers. And, you know, they don't know me like how my other family member know, you know, would, would know me because if we're not we don't get together on events anymore. This, uh, events on the, on, you know, like every holiday, having a barbecue, a get together, some type of get together, some type of Sunday dinner or something. So, you know, but I think I think it's important if you have a big family to at least on the holidays just have something, you know, mm -hmm. have a potluck. Have everybody bring something, you know, if somebody can't bring something, just have to invite the whole invite invite the kids out and just. Make sure that everybody knows everybody. I think that's the important thing about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, funerals, it seems like whenever we get together, whenever we have a funeral, we always say, well, how come this is the only time we come out and greet each other? We need to do more stuff. And then in between, sometime between the next funeral, we may have one cookout, one get together, uh, or, or maybe not. The next funeral will just come up. And then we'll say it again. We'll say, well, this is the only time we get together when there's a funeral and not, you know, we need to get together more often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. If you got family, make sure you make sure you just spend time with them. Yes. Oh, by all means. I'm so glad you say that. I mean, that is so important. And um, but by the way, you know, um, honestly, it's for the best that uh I, I, I don't know how to say this. I was going to say it's for the best that COVID-19 uh, happened because, uh, you know, in the situation you're in, a barbecue wouldn't be too enjoyable anyway. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, not, not, the, not the food, but, you know, the, the fellowship. I just, you know, I just, our Mother's Day, I got together for a little fellowship, you know, with, with, with everyone and everything. So that was, that was nice. Nice to just see people. But, yeah, I can't really enjoy myself in the sense that, you know, I enjoy good food. That's to me. That's one of the good things. That nice. I I enjoy classic cars, pretty girls, and good food. That's that's so American. That is that is so <laughs> fucking American. It's like instead of going to school to learn the three R's of writing, reading, and arithmetic, it was the three B's: babes, Buicks, and oh fuck, what what what, what, what was the other B? Barbecue. Yeah, barbecue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't have gotten that out without you. Oh my fucking god! That's yes, that's it. Um. Uh, so, um. Oh god. Uh. Brendan, help me out here. What was uh. Uh. Tell um. Derek how lucky he is to have a fam, a, a fucking family that he actually loves and enjoys. I mean, you don't have any of that. <laughs> so other than the extended electronic family, uh. That uh. So yeah, tell us a bit about what it's like to have. Uh, what, what do you right. do? Right. No, these? it's important to stay connected to family and like. There's other ways to you know. 
have that familial connection, you know, as humans. Of course. Well, well, well how, how do you how do you do that without um, you know? I mean, your family members weren't really prizes in any sense. You know, yeah. Well, when I was younger, we did a lot of that, you know, gathering and stuff like that. And uh, so I have like you know fond memories of that. And also like you know meeting new people, like going, for example, going over to that lady's house and you know meeting new cultures and stuff. That's kind of my way of dealing with that. But I mean, of course, um, it is important. I mean, of course, that's like just a human thing. It's like, yeah. Th- thank you. That 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 was deep. That was. Uh, I'm glad you've got some pleasant memories. I'm surprised you've got that. I mean, oh my God. Uh, uh, so that's 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 good. That's good. Um, I mean, yes. were, were they like different people back then? Like something happened that changed them, or 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 what? I mean, what what the fuck? It was just like like Derek was saying. Like people kind of went their own ways and kind of like didn't gather as much as they used to. Some something like that. It's something yeah. like I, I think it was something a little heavier than that. I, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, um, but um, yeah. So what do you do these days? It's, it's like obviously you don't have German woman inviting you to their home for dinner every holiday. What what, what are you doing in general these days when it comes to the holidays? It, it, like uh, like like what? What do you what do you do? I go to friends and so uh, like, friends. I have friends that I hang out with or that are like close to you know basically family. Okay. Oh good. Levels. Like, good uh, good. Is, is is the young Mister Griffin one of them? I would consider Michael yes like basically family or like you know. Mm-hmm. There's others too. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, go on. Both of you guys keep 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 going. I'm just like you know, honestly. I, you know, I got another. I got please, another story here please. that we can touch on. Oh please! Uh, and, the, and the article says police station surrounded and vandalized as rioting breaks out at Minneapolis that mayor encouraged people to attend. Now the rioters. Uh, the people who are rioting said anyone within a five-hour driving distance needs to attend. But the, in the article headline here, it actually shows a police car that's been spray-painted. And that kind of reminds me of the L.A. riots. In the L.A. riots, you had police that were had on all this riot gear, yet they were cowering inside the police station, uh, afraid of the people on the outside of the police station that were, you know, had baseball bats and here you got here you got the police with machine guns and uh everything else all this riot gear and they were they were hiding inside the police station hoping that the people outside would just go away <laughs> you know so, <laughs> you have yeah you have the a police car here that's that's been spray painted and then somebody wrote fuck you or something on the on the side of the police car so you know uh, the people aren't taking this shit anymore we're tired of this dumb shit yeah. You know, it's like a ritual. It's like, okay, the first time we, we, we the, most of this year, we had a stay inside order. And as soon as it gets warm out and the, just let us out, they got to go back to their killing ritual like it's a damn ritual or something. Like they have to have so much blood to appease whatever beast it is they're worshiping. Yes, thank you. I, I mean, that, that that's actually fair. It's a fair thing to say. Uh, it, it, it's a... It's, uh, um, it's it's something that has to change. The dynamic has to change, and as I said, one way to do that would be uh, a, a predominantly female police force that would help immensely. And as I said, draft it so it would be of all races and ethnicities and a, a national police force. I mean, it, we would see this dynamic change so radically. What we have in the sense of urban constabularies is we have essentially um, uh, basically gangs in uniform. These are like white gangs in blue uniforms in, in general, and the black men who serve with them oftentimes just become kind of like, um, uh, 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 at that point, it's a, a kind of like they're all blue. <laughs> they're no longer, uh, the, the, the blacks tend to, they want their pension, they want their uh, benefits, uh, they're on the in crowd, uh, they aren't really going to do anything to shake up the system. Uh, in effect, many of them aren't really helping, uh, so it doesn't really change the community dynamics. And the other problem is, of course, they're all fucking men, and men are simply just uh, infested with testosterone, and uh, it, they're rendered re- just totally inf- non-functional by it, as far as I'm concerned. 
Uh, so, uh, it, it, you know, it, your point is well taken, and, um, uh, you know, go on to any other stories that you have. Um, and um, let me try and calculate what time it is in New York and how long we've been on, because uh, we were, um, yeah, take your time. Keep going. Yeah, we've only been on for like uh, probably two hours or something. So, what, yeah, what did we start at? Let me see. I got a counter here. Two hours and 15 minutes. Yeah, and and yeah. we've already got half a hundred watching, so that's incredible. I mean, oh my God, I, I feel obligated to try and deliver something, but you know, as you can imagine, I'm not really in the mood. So, but uh, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, get me up there, you know. Keep going, and uh, and of course, Brendan as well. I'm sure he has some stories, you know. Uh, you know what? Well, what, what, <laughs> I guess I'd better bring that up later. <laughs> Somebody sent me an email saying. I hope the money Brendan got. Oh, Brendan! Brendan, where are you? Brendan. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. For God's sakes, I, I, I gave a shout out thanking the three ladies who gave you money. Okay, while you're here, do that for us. Okay. Yes, I should officially thank them. Yes. Yes. So, of course, like Lena Shea, thank you very much for the assistance. And it's all going to good causes to keep me alive until I get a job. And then, of course, thank you to Selena Khan, who's been amazing like person and just like helpful you know and instead of just taking the option of just giving me money and hoping for the best she gave me some like life advice too so like that's greatly appreciated and that's worth more than any amount of money of course and then um i also got a donation from uh, gabrielle darling as well and i really appreciate what she wrote to me and how um she appreciated my many lectures on anthropology and various like fruit things so, yeah, that money's going to a good place, and it's um, going to sustain me until I'm employed. So thank you. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Uh, let people know how you were really on the edge before this happened. Uh... Right. Basically, like, I wouldn't have made any of my bills that I had to pay within, like, this week. So right now I'm, like, um, not out of the woods completely, but I'm, like, you know, very much in a better place because of them. And... They were all wonderful ladies, you know, so that's something to note. Yes, yes, and um, I, so, so I got a uh, personal message here saying, I hope Brendan didn't spend it all on drugs. Well, let me tell you, he gets all the drugs he needs just by walking the nature trail and eating all that shit he finds <laughs> along the side. I mean, we got him so high sometimes, he just like, um, yeah, well, you've, you've seen the result. Oh my God! Uh, well, uh, at any right. Rate. Most of the time, it's just like herbs, like herbals. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't, I don't really buy drugs. You know, like it's not something you I do. You don't have the money. I mean, the streets <laughs> yeah, exactly. just too expensive. I mean, even the money that you got is not going to cover your average cost for you know real hard shit. So. Um, right, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, hey, um, yeah. I have a. I, I I posted one story here. I don't know if you heard about this, Douglas. But uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, a famous pastor named Pastor John Hagee. But John Hagee's brother, who was a police constable, was arrested for child molestation. And now, I, I don't know, there was a little girl in his custody. And it started when she was five. And it went from the time she was five to she was 12. It stopped when she was 12 because she it started menstruating. At 13, so I guess after she started mis menstruating, he he became uninterested or, or whatnot. But um, she was 18 now that she reported the, the story, but she reported it to John Hagee's wife, and it doesn't look good that uh, John Hagee's wife reported it to him, and he never called the police. But um, you know, this of course this is after the fact that you know she's an adult and everything. But still, um, have you heard about that story? God no, no, I, I haven't. That's appalling. That's 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 appalling. Oh my God, that's 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 unspeakable. That's disgusting. Thank you for sharing that. That's um yes. So so was that to cheer me up or just <laughs> the, the horror goes on? Yes, I, I it makes a point. Of course, that this this goes on everywhere, especially in many religious communities. The Americans focus, of course, on the Roman Catholic Church, so they politicize it by trying to, uh, uh, you know, pin it all on a particular faith that they don't particularly like because they're all Protestants. Uh, well, the Protestants put the Roman Catholic Church to shame with shit like this, and it's pervasive. I mean, this is what we're learning of. You can imagine what we don't learn of. 
Uh, no, this is like uh, disgusting, and I, uh, it, you, you know, the man needs to be fucking, uh, you, you know, taken out and and executed painfully. Uh, so, um, oh, you, you know, aside from all that, uh, no, definitely appreciate your bringing that up, and uh, yeah, yeah, go on, you know. Uh, uh, after all, uh, life is an endless sea of horrors, right? <laughs> what else is out there that you notice? Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wuhan Lab Chief says, virus escape theory is pure fabrication. So uh, the head of a Wuhan laboratory who scientists who drew international review for modifying that coronavirus to infect human says the notion that a human infecting back coronavirus with pendulum COV binding mechanism escape from dead lab is pure fabrication. So they're denying that um, the virus escaped from one of the labs in Wuhan. Uh, in a Saturday interview with CCP state media, Wang uh, his last name is spelled Y-A-N-Y-I, director of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, WIV, said the institute first received a clinical sample of SARS-CoV-2 on December 30th and claims we didn't have any knowledge before that, nor had we ever encountered research or kept the virus. In fact, like everyone else, we didn't even know the virus existed. How could it have leaked from our lab when we never had it, she added. So um, that's just a story that's in the news mm -hmm. about something, something else about the virus. Because the U.S. is expected to pass 100K death Sunday. Oxford vaccine trial uh, faces major setback. So we're about to, we're about to surpass 100,000 deaths. So... Um, what do you guys think about that? Uh, well, well, I mean, of course... There's a lot that... Yeah, go on. Oh, yeah, there's a lot that it brings up to mind. Like a, like that lady that was studying the the bat, um, you know, G, the sequencing the coronavirus in bats, like, what I got from what I read was that she was actually doing all that work on a United States loan, or, like, grant, you know? Mm -hmm. So when they started accusing China of creating this virus or, you know, spreading it or whatever, you know, they actually removed or, like, revoked her grant that they were giving her. So it's, like, you know, it's it's hard to say, like, who to believe or, like, you know, how much of this was, like, a joint operation or, like, whatever you want to call it, but where we were working on it together. Like, who knows? Yeah. Well, I heard so about it hard to say. from, from uh, some scientists in Boston Mm -hmm. that were connected with uh, spreading the virus, and then I've never heard the story again. I'd seen the story one time, and then yeah. it disappeared out of the news. Okay. So, right. Yeah, yeah. and um, so tell us a bit about what you heard about coronavirus uh, being perfect for, like, gene work or, 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 or some kind of a, a kind of manipulation. You had heard that initially, and, of course, that's controversial, but uh, it, tell right. us what was... It, 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 it sounded so compelling. It was presented in such a fashion that it sounded like it, it, it was logical. So, uh, you know, go into a bit of what uh, was presented uh, with this kind of... Well, what I, well, just what I heard at the beginning of this is that basically every bio, um, you know, what is it? Like a biological science or what's the word um, I'm looking for? Microbiology. Every microbiology company that gets into the business, they they basically use coronavirus as like a virus that can transmit RNA to like other viruses and very, you know, it's a very versatile one, like virus to use. So what I heard was that it's something that every, basically every company that or research group or university that is involved in like sequencing viruses, is like using a coronavirus actually. So that's like, that could add to more of the, you know, fuzziness of it but like you said there are other people that say that that's completely false but the person who i heard it from was like he was a he is a you know a german like scientist who was into biology so like i don't know why he would say that offhand but mm -hmm. yeah. 
there's a lot of info going around. Who knows? Well, there's definitely something that is so different about uh, coronavirus as it's manifested uh, in the mutation which now causes COVID-19 that uh, it, it is not it's not asinine or idiotic to uh, investigate whether or not it was bioengineered. It is just that different. Right. It, it, it doesn't, well, the way it's acting is, to give people an example of this, um, it, you are not only having it transmit as if it were a sexually transmitted disease, where it is going through uh, people's seminal fluids into other people and uh, transferring as if it were syphilis or gonorrhea. Uh, you also have the fact that uh, you have people who are... Um, uh, it goes through people's fecal matter. So it's going through both the, uh, you know, which normally uh, viruses do not survive the intestinal tract because the intestinal tract mm -hmm. is loaded with uh, all manner of, uh, uh, of acids that uh, just tend to wipe out most uh, viruses. Uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be like normally you wouldn't get it through, say, for instance, the fecal matter of a bird because... It, the digestive tract of a bird would just essentially wipe out most of this kind of uh, viral life before, you know, if they crapped on you, you wouldn't catch it that way normally with a virus. Okay, everything has changed. All the rules have changed with coronavirus. And then beyond that, it's going through breast milk into children. So infants are being born with COVID-19 and, and entering from the womb directly onto ventilators. Okay, this is all true. This is not scaremongery. This is not uh, fear porn. Uh, this is uh, the fact that it's going through breast milk, the fact that it's going through uh, fecal matter, the fact that it's uh, which, of course, is impacting us because when you flush a toilet, that fecal matter particulates and the particulate matter from uh, fecal matter goes into a room and floods an entire, you know, it aerates, goes through the air of an entire lavatory, a bathroom. Uh, and so it's hanging out in the air in a cloud, uh, which the next person walking in to use a public bathroom booth inhales. Uh, so uh, we, we, we're talking about that with fecal matter. We're talking about the sexual transmission. We're talking about babies being born with it uh, and or contracting it from their mothers who catch it after the baby is born and then uh, give it to the baby or pass it on to them through breast milk. Okay, none of this is normal. There's no virus in the history right. of humanity that has ever behaved like this. So uh, it adds to the uh, suspicion. And uh, yes, coronavirus is real. Don't buy any myths that it is not. It's very real. Uh, and uh, our man, uh, John Warrington was bringing up the fact saying, uh, you know, um, they use the term pandemic. And uh, in, in the ancient world, the classical definition of pan, I'm not talking about pan, the Greek god, the satyr, uh, you know, with the goat's legs and the big dick and the uh, uh, little flute that he that he plays. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, the um, uh, pan as in all pervasive, it meant universal. So when we were uh, talking about uh, J Jonathan Warrington and myself, uh, verbally speaking, he was like saying, you know, you would think that pandemic would mean that it's on the trees, it's on leaves, it's on, you know, your vegetables when you eat, it's on everywhere. And I, I said, you know, it's, it's damn well close. Uh, aside from, you know, a pandemic does not mean that in the medical sense. It doesn't mean everywhere or universally. Normally, when it's used medically, the only difference is that an epidemic is a disease that is, uh, has saturated a nation state, that, that, that there's, a, there's a spread of a disease throughout a nation state. That's an epidemic. When it crosses national borders and becomes international, then uh, it becomes a pandemic, meaning that it's, it's, uh, it's beyond a simple nation state problem. It's a problem of the world, the human species. That's what a pandemic means. So this is definitively that, but frighteningly, it comes close to the classical definition of universal because it lives on doorknobs and can survive on inanimate objects and, and inorganic surfaces for days. So if it can live on cardboard for up to three days, which it can, it, or, or, or a doorknob out right. in the weather, uh, the cold or the heat, uh, different extremes, and and uh, and 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 not uh, die. This is this is new. This is this is unprecedented. This is as if it were bioengineered. Now, of course, the um, conventional specialists are adamant 
that it is a product of nature as unnatural as it's acting and this would imply that nature is striking back which is what the Pope says and by the way if you ever listen to the Pope and listen to what he says about COVID-19 and how we should uh, respect nature and this is a response to our disrespect of nature this is a, a nature taking care of itself uh, uh, all of this then is uh, that what the Pope is saying that inspires him to say we need to listen to the indigenous peoples the indigenous peoples are the people who uh, can show us the path to recovery uh, by treating nature well so that nature doesn't respond with these pandemics uh, at this point I say Pope for fucking president honestly the, the, and all you people who hate him just because he's the leader of a church that you dislike uh, and that uh, American Protestants have uh, taken as satanic in their own fundamentalist insanity uh, their interpretation of a church that's been around for a thousand years and was the bulwark of Western civilization uh, this is one of those things that is preposterous to me it, it, it literally uh, renders much of America uh, irredeemable uh, the fact that they have no tolerance uh, for other religions and that the fact that they uh, believe that just because a person is a member of a different religion that they should burn in hell this is the kind of intolerance that leads to the violence we keep experiencing in America and why it keeps manifesting over and over again and I for one am frankly uh, sick of it uh, so uh, definitively um, uh, I, I thank both of you gentlemen uh, for uh, bringing everything that you do up and uh, honestly, uh, both of you gentlemen, please continue. I doubt I'll go in the direction of conspiracies tonight because uh, I've been so worn out by just getting us on air. And, and I want people to know we are on air, of course, thanks to uh, several people, uh, everybody in Team Dietrich. Uh, I could not have done it without Lena Shea and uh, Brendan Zogit. And, uh, it, of course, uh, such people as uh, my 3D graphics modeler, uh, in his own way, of course, who, uh, it, it, well, there's a, there's, there's a different story with that that's a bit more convoluted. Uh, but uh, uh, aside from all of that, the fact that we were able to get back on took a uh, team effort, and it's, it's left me uh, pretty exhausted. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, so please, both you gentlemen, uh, go on uh, for a while more, and uh, we'll uh, take it to the top of the hour at least. And uh, at that point, it'll be like uh, um, 10 to 11, it'll be like midnight. I'll have to like central. head to bed at some early like, pretty soon. Okay, but, like, that's understandable. Then after you go, um, I might talk for a little bit and then kind of close down for the night. And uh, Derek Talley, of course, will um, he should go to bed for the sake of his health on his birthday. And it'll be about midnight his time at the top of the hour anyway. So uh, we'll ask him how he feels then. And, uh, you know, of course, um, you and I should sing him happy birthday, but that, that would be more of a punishment than a gift. Uh, I, mean, <laughs> I, I remember what you guys did for Judith Ager, and I was surprised that she even uh, liked that was That Sarah, was Sarah Shields. You had us sing happy birthday to Sarah. That too, yes, and Judith Ager. Yeah, both, both okay. at different times, yeah. And uh, Sarah Shields was asking about tonight. By the way, Sarah Shields, honey, if you're out there, you know, don't use the word aw when you, when you wrote down, oh, no, transmission tonight, aw. You know, that sounds really, really, I know you don't intend it as such. Uh, I would hope you don't intend it as such, but it sounds really passive aggressive. <laughs> uh, aw is not usually taken as like a, a comforting statement uh, to make when uh, talking about. Uh, uh, the challenges people are dealing with uh, but uh, uh, just a little uh, hint there for the future so uh, aside from all that um, yeah keep going both of you gentlemen and um, you, well, you do, uh, elsewhere in the news Hertz files for bankruptcy as lockdowns crush rental car industry so Hertz, <laughs> yeah Hertz is, is really hurting Hertz is hurting and Hertz was founded in 1918 when it set up shop with a dozen Ford Model T's uh, quietly filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, struggling under the massive debt load after its business was brought to a grinding halt during the coronavirus pandemic and talks with creditors filed to result in much needed relief. The company had a total of 568,000 vehicles 
and 12,400 corporate and franchise locations worldwide at the start of this year, and about a third of their locations are at the airports. So now Hertz has got to file for bankruptcy, uh, along with all the other businesses that are, are going to completely go out of business. Right. Well, um, that's thank you for bringing that up. And uh, uh, what does that remind me of? Anyhow, um, uh, Brendan, uh, any any input mm -hmm. with that? Uh, the rent a car agency and the like. I I'll tell you what I heard. I I, I heard um, the tourist little tourist buggies. We have these little buggies in San Francisco that they put the tourists in, and it takes them on a guided tour of the city. That they actually use the tape recorded uh, audio file. Uh, it tells them where to go, where to turn. So they go up different hills, and it gives their history. I've been hearing that the past few days for the first time in a long time. So the city's opening up again to tourism. And so, yeah, tell us a little bit, Brendan, about what you see opening up mm -hmm. around your neighborhood, aside from all the uh, the sketch shit, and, and include the sketch oh, shit, right. too. Right, yeah, well, I mean, uh, people are coming back outside. I went to a farmer's market, and it was, like, wall-to-wall -wall people. Like, this was, like, a couple days ago, and then there was also, I'm looking at this bar right now, or, like, some kind of restaurant, and it's it's been full since I got here earlier, so it's, like... Mm -hmm. People are starting to pack restaurants and go back to bars. And, you know, uh, it seems like you know they're just waiting. They're ready, you know. Yeah. But maybe we should be a bit more patient. But you know. I I would think so. Yes, <laughs> and, and you know that's this this is going to cause a big spike. And you know I don't right. I don't want to overdwell on the coronavirus tonight. But you know definitely right. it's it's going to be back. I, and and I'm going to be talking about it. And that's going to be inescapable. Um, so I, uh, I do um, encourage everyone in the chat room, by the way, um, to continue interacting a little bit more. Jay Corden said, Douglas, over the last four to five years, you have never ceased to amaze me. Amaze me. Uh, again, thank you. So I deeply appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Jay G Corden. Uh, bless you. Then, of course, um, a few other things Jay Corden says I can't really make sense of. <laughs> Nathan Brooks says, peace, brethren. Uh, and that's wonderful. Uh, love you, brother. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, Veronica Barrera uh, has uh, left a symbol there. Hey, honey, glad that you're back with us now that we were able to get back on. And uh, so Jameson, of course, uh, was talking about, oh, yes, the, the hidden tree of the uh, Rasha, the anti-life uh, forces of uh, the antithesis of the Kabbalah tree of life and death. And Daniel Arola was saying, I dig it earlier. And, um, and of course, he and Crystal River were talking about how high they were. And uh, so Jay Jones, of course, was adding in uh, different... Uh, aspects of uh the context and jim davis was saying i'm just an old white man and fan for years mr ddd uh, bless you good sir love you dearly and um several people have said have happy birthday derek sarah shields and of course uh aside uh from that francis williams and uh as well um the uh francis williams says uh can you speak on the u.s sub that went down in the 60s the uss scorpion Wonder if you have any knowledge uh, on the subject. We'll go into that a little bit in the future. And uh, as for, um, okay, um, <laughs> Selena Khan. Uh, I'm laughing because she blocked Jay Corden <laughs> or, or like uh, deleted a lot of his comments uh, because apparently he was just getting kind of rowdy. Uh, so uh, aside from all of that, um, Selena Khan says very much a happy birthday. She sent to me in the private messages wish, wishing you a very happy birthday, Derek. And so, um, uh, you know, everybody here is glad that you're doing as well as you are. And with that, I'll just kind of uh, close off a little bit with what I think is important. And I won't keep us much longer. Both these gentlemen need to go to bed. And I'm not quite sure I can last uh, too much longer after them. I do want people to understand that um it's kind of like this is some of the problems that we deal with in western perception of uh of uh, reality uh western perception of reality is is completely perverse in ways that don't manifest consciously people don't really understand how they don't see other people as humans with independent thoughts or action capabilities of their own or even options um, a great example of this is World War II, when Americans speak of Japan in 1945. And Americans and Russians, they talk about Japan as if the Japanese have absolutely no 
volition of their own or no options or quote unquote no way out that sort of mentality where they're boxed in and they're in a squeeze box and therefore have lost all semblance of control over their own destiny or fate uh now i've proven repeatedly over the years by exposing all the facts that are out there that uh, nothing could be further from the truth and uh, the Russians and the Americans and the Britons live in a revisionist fantasy world that has not served them well. Their quality of life is far below that of any of the former Axis powers, like Japan or Germany in particular. And so it's a scenario in which it's like somebody who's been uh, dragged down and, uh, and, and uh, beaten and, uh, and they're still screaming, say uncle, say uncle. It's, 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 it's beyond insane. Uh, these people have been beaten to the point where they live in a world of denial. And so the same actually goes for Taiwan, where most people who speak of Taiwan, and like I said, I'm not antithetical to this because it serves the purposes of Taiwan anyway. But the majority of Americans speak of Taiwan as if it has no ability to defend itself, has no capabilities uh, to control its own destiny, has no options out there in the world, because, of course, uh, uh, the fact remains that Taiwan is not legally recognized by the United Nations as an extant nation. Uh, a, uh, and, and so, as a result, since it's viewed as the enemy of the United Nations, uh, what Taiwan has is few allies that essentially recognize Taiwan as the legitimate government of all China, or at least an independently legitimate government. There's only about 19, you know, close to a score of those nations, close to 20 of those nations in the world. And, uh, of course, the Chinese are doing their best to buy out some of those nations, and, and the results have not been well. Uh, those nations have turned against their leaders who have chosen communist China over Taiwan, uh, the, the results have not been good for their economy. It has not been good for uh, their autonomy uh, because the Chinese don't respect autonomy in the communists under, under communism. That kind of reminds me of what they did to um, Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. The Chinese gave the Sri Lankans this like uh, this loan mm -hmm. to build a, I think it's some sort of like dock mm -hmm. in Colombo, one of their capitals. Oh yeah, yeah. Go on. And, yeah. yeah, and um, and the Sri Lankans defaulted on the loan, and it basically, it was written into the contract that if that happened, then the Chinese would effectively um, administer it for 99 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the yeah, they're still in like a legal battle with China, trying to get that revoked or like overturned. Mm -hmm. But basically, the Chinese like, yeah, like took over that port that they built there for 99 years. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. there, there, there you go. And there's nothing that the Sri Lankans can do about it. They can't, like, okay. you know, fight them or anything. Else. Yeah, and, and thank you. I mean, an excellent point and uh, well appreciated. So uh, we, we definitely are in a situation where uh, those of you who are not familiar with this sort of phenomenon, uh, you tend to Im Im impose in your view of the world. However inaccurate it is, an enormous amount of power on the part of the Communist Chinese Empire. Americans assume that it is literally a steamroller that cannot be stopped uh, without seeing all of its faults, all of its shortcomings. I'm not speaking in the moral sense. I'm talking in terms of logistics or military projection capabilities. Its threat projection capabilities are, in a certain sense, abysmal. Uh, and uh, the same with Russia's. Uh, I mean, a good example is uh, the uh, Asian Indians purchased a Russian aircraft carrier uh, that they are so fucking sorry they purchased. It is just a piece of shit, and, and they're stuck with this piece of shit that isn't even fit for scrap or salvage, and, uh, and they're trying to make this goddamn thing work. I mean, the only carrier the Russians have afloat is considered punishment detail. Uh, where men are exposed to radiation to a degree where, you know, they shorten their lives by 10 to 20 years. 
Uh, so this is what the Asian Indians are dealing with now due to their stupidity of their Russian uh, defense contract alliance. Uh, so in, in light of this kind of uh, incompetence and, and corruption on the part of the Sino-Slavic Synaxis, I mean, the Russians are paying the price for COVID-19, uh, and it's karmic for everything they've been doing to everybody else, and it's ripping through Russia right now. Right. Um, and, that kind uh, of brings to oh. mind, like, how did the... How did the Russians get Vladivostok if the Chinese had owned it? Was that something to do with like the Korean War or? Oh no 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 no! That was during the Tsarist era. The, the Tsarist. Oh, era. it was even before that. So yeah. it was a Chinese city like that far back. Oh yeah, it was a Chinese city wow. for centuries, and then what happened was the Russians overtook it during the Great Expansion to the Pacific, and that was the closest they could get to a warm oh, water port. That so they fought tooth and nail for it, invading uh, Manchuria at the time. And taking that okay. uh, city, uh, Vladivostok. Um, now, uh, in terms of Taiwan, just to give people an example of uh, the options Taiwan has and that it's using, um, the uh, female president of Taiwan, uh, Tsai Ing wen, has vowed an action plan uh, for Hong Kong protesters. Now, uh, before I even uh, kind of outline uh, what she's insinuating, it's important. That everyone uh, know this much. I mean, we could ask a question, really, that could kind of sum up uh, the, the real situation in terms of Western civilization. And that is, can Europe make it? Because Western civilization is not fucking United States and Canada or North America. It, it's Europe, of course, which is the core. And this brings us back to woman in power. Uh, countries with female leaders suffer six times six fucking times fewer COVID deaths and we'll all recover sooner from recession. It just goes to show you that men are fucking worthless when it comes to leadership. The time is over. They offer nothing but violence, corruption, and death. Uh, it, it's the woman in power. This is orders of magnitude. Fewer COVID deaths and are leading their countries economically to prosperity. See, because women never dared to underestimate the risks, they focused on preventative measures, and they prioritized long-term social well-being over short-term economic considerations. So, the COVID crisis confirms what policy analysts have argued forever, that female leadership is more engaged on issues of social equality, sustainability, and innovation, making societies far more resilient to external shocks. Now, they've run statistical analyses on available data on the coronavirus pandemic and a series of dimensions of public health, social progress, basic human needs, and economic resilience with stunning correlations. First of all, current data proves that countries with women in leadership position have suffered six times fewer confirmed deaths from COVID-19 than countries with governments led by men. And moreover, female-led governments have proven themselves orders of magnitude more effective and rapid at flattening the epidemic's curve with peaks in daily deaths roughly six times lower than in countries ruled by men. Finally, the average number of days with confirmed deaths was 34 in countries ruled by women and 48 in countries with male-dominated governments. Now, if you're a prick, and I say that as an entendre, you would argue that correlation is not causation. But when we look at most female-led governments' approach to the crisis, we find similar policies that definitively made all the difference via V their male counterparts. They never dared to underestimate the risks. They focused on all preventive measures immediately and prioritized long-term social well-being over short-term economic considerations. Now, Taiwan, of course, my homeland and heartland, is that preeminent case in point. It is the model. And of course, what models Taiwan? 
the art elect, the D trick. By the way, we're getting a wind tunnel where Brendan is. If you could oh, get sorry. mute, that would be appreciated. Um, yes. Yeah. Are you? Are you have to take your leave of us now? Or yeah, I'll actually have to go. Um, but that night. just brought to mind that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know that that one video with the the avalanche and then the wife is saying like shouldn't we run yes and the husband's like oh it's no big deal it's kind of like that situation and yeah. then like when shit hits the fan it's like you know wife obviously who yeah. was right yes <laughs> thank you thank you and then also with Taiwan um the last I heard what Saying and Wen was saying she she was saying that they were they basically stabilized production of. Um, of uh, safety masks yeah you know like face masks yes and they were about to resume international distribution so not only did they bounce back but now they're helping the rest of the world so you know absolutely <laughs> thanks Taiwan. yes yeah. thank you thank you we have a blessed night um yes sweet your dreams good night brandon yes. good night everyone thank you derek yes. happy birthday yes. thank you douglas right. thank you yes and uh so uh uh, Taiwan, of course, is where the government of Prime Minister Tsai Ing-wen consults with the Dietrich Art elect, and uh, that, of course, was the uh, artificial intelligence that was neuronically combed from myself in that horrible experiment uh, that damn near killed me, as so many other things have almost done uh, over the years at the Presidio military base. Uh, but she herself, of course, uh, being wise enough to consult regularly with the Dietrich Art elect has uh, provided herself uh, or proven herself as a role model in leadership, uh, knowing, of course, just how effective it can be to consult with an art elect that has the best interests of one's people at heart. Tsai Ing Wen uh, built on Taiwan's previous experience with SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, uh, to immediately introduce targeted measures and medical checks, which massively reduced the risk of an outbreak and therefore made a lockdown completely unnecessary, unlike in most other East Asian countries, including the equally small Singapore, the city-state which instead suffered several waves of contagion. And New Zealand's government of Yacinda Ardern was also prompt in implementing restrictive measures early on because Yacinda Ardern openly declared she was emulating Taiwan, again, indirectly thereby receiving the wisdom of the Dietrich Ard elect as the model on which to base her decisions. Uh, and this resulted in limited contagion and a much shorter lockdown than neighboring countries in the Pacific. And a similar pattern occurred in Denmark, Norway, and Finland, all ruled by women as opposed to Sweden, where economic considerations trumped, and I use that term pointedly, all health concerns, resulting in the highest death toll per capita in Europe. Now, over the past few years, most women-led governments have also placed a stronger emphasis on social and environmental well-being, investing in more public, more in public health, and reducing air pollution, which has been proven to be decisively associated with COVID deaths. And so, analyses have confirmed that countries with higher female representation in national parliaments perform far better in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction, air pollution, containment, and biodiversity conservation. Some of these governments have also launched an international alliance to promote social and ecological well-being as the cornerstone of their economic policies. These are all important features that make a societies more resilient via the external shocks. So when it comes to confirmed deaths, what's taken into account is the confirmed deaths of COVID-19, the number of days with at least one reported death of COVID-19, the peak in daily deaths, and all of these statistics were sourced from the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And basic needs were calculated by taking into account the basic human needs score. And this is through 2019 as compared 
to what is going on, or rather ongoing this year. And that would incorporate or integrate, that would take into calculation nutrition and basic medical care, water and sanitation, shelter and personal safety. All of this was sourced through the social progress imperative, the social progress imperative, the SPI, acronymous as SPI, and the Gini coefficient of income distribution source. Uh, the, now that, of course, is uh, sourced from the World Bank Center. And the GDP growth rate percent reduction forecasts for 2020 are the gross domestic product was sourced from the European Commission and national central banks. So against this backdrop of all these factors taken into account, it is to myself and anyone with any sense of social awareness completely unsurprising that woman-led countries are also calculated to suffer the least from the ensuing economic recession. GDP growth forecasts for 2020 indicate that they will experience a decline lower than 5.5%, while countries with male leaders will shrink by over 7%. There is probably, to your average skeptic or your diehard denialist, never enough hard evidence to demonstrate that there be a clear female factor at play. But we cannot simply dismiss such overtly stark differences as anything casual. Some women leaders have understood that placing social and environmental well-being at the core of national policymaking has positive effects on society's resilience and benefits the economy too. It would be wise for their male colleagues to take notice. Now, the countries with female leaders that I've been citing include Belgium, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Dein Wiverni Deutschland, or the new United Germany, Greece, with a female president, Iceland, New Zealand, Norway, Slovakia, and over and above all, Taiwan. Countries with male leaders that have gone into the sewer are Austria, Bulgaria, Brazil, Croatia, Cyprus, the Czech Republic, France, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Malta, the Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, and the lowest from the sewer into the septic tank, the United Kingdom and the United States of America, at the absolute bottom with skyrocketing economic collapse, unemployment, and death tolls, the highest in the world in the United States compared to all other nations on earth. And so when it comes to Hong Kong, Taiwan has its options. And Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, midweek of Yester Septimania, last week, pledged a humanitarian action plan for Hong Kongers pushing for democracy in the financial hub as an influx of activists seeks sanctuary on mine own homeland and heartland, the self-ruled democratic islands of Formosa, the Portuguese word for beautiful island, which was always the true term for Taiwan, and of course the Nationalist Republic of China re-established thereon. Now Hong Kong was upended by months of oft-times violent pro-democracy protests yesteryear. Sparked by rising fears that Beijing is chipping away at the city's freedoms, and unrest has returned in recent days after Beijing announced plans last week to impose a sweeping national security law in response to the protests, a move that has alarmed many Western governments, and of course, my native Taiwan. 
Beijing claims sovereignty over Taiwan and has vowed to one day seize it by force if necessary. Its leadership loathes Tsai Ing-wen in particular because she regards my island as a de facto independent state and not part of one China. And speaking about the new security law plans, Tsai urged Beijing to rein in the horse at the edge of the precipice and said her administration would continue to offer assistance to Hong Kongers seeking to relocate. Herself telling reporters that our determination to look after Hong Kongers has remained unchanged. The cabinet will come up with a Hong Kong humanitarian assistance plan, an assistance action plan, to provide complete planning for Hong Kong's people's residency, accommodation, and care. And so Tsai said the office that deals with Chinese affairs, the Mainland Affairs Council, would be tasked with drafting said plans. Now last year, over 5,000 Hong Kongers moved to Taiwan, up 41% from a year earlier. Some of them fleeing prosecution over the protests or seeking a new life in one of Asia's most progressive democracies. Tsai's comments came as rights groups urged her government to enact a refugee law to help Hong Kong protesters fleeing to the island. Taiwan does not recognize the legal concept of asylum or accept refugee applications, fearful of a potential influx from the authoritarian mainland. But Hong Kongers can apply to live on the island through a variety of means, including investment visas. Taiwanese law also stipulates unspecified necessary assistance for Hong Kong and Macau residents whose safety and freedom are in urgent danger due to political reasons. Taiwan-based rights group the Hong Kong Outlanders urged Tsai's government to set up a clear asylum system soon at a press conference Yester Septimania, midweek last week, on Wednesday, in which Kumi Yong, the spokesman for the group, stated that the national security law will have devastating effects on Hong Kong, and we expect a large number of Hong Kong protesters to come to Taiwan to seek help when the pandemic eases. So, Taiwan seeks to welcome Hong Kongers, fleeing the security law crackdown. Taiwan is devising a settlement plan for Hong Kongers who have been pushing for freedom and democracy. And this is because that controversial national security law is looming. And so Tsai Ing-wen even wrote on Facebook midweek last week on Wednesday that the country's executive branch is devising this humanitarian aid action plan for Hong Kongers as the city-state's autonomy is being undermined at rapid pace. She's so writing that the executive won will impose a comprehensive and concrete plan as soon as possible. The plan includes Hong Kongers' right of abode and settlement, adding that Taiwan's commitment to caring for Hong Kongers has remained unchanged. Uh, she's so stating that if the situation in Hong Kong worsens and its autonomy and human rights are further suppressed, we will resolutely voice our concerns. We will continue to support Hong Kongers' determination to strive for democracy and freedom, which are paramount to its peace and stability. And she also mentioned that the country of my homeland has adopted looser measures for Hong Kongers who are seeking to immigrate to Taiwan resulting in more than 5,000 people moving to my island last year, a 41% increase compared to the previous. And Taiwan does not normally accept refugee applications, but Hong Kongers can live there with investment or work visas. An immigration consultancy company previously noted an overnight tenfold increase in inquiries about moving to Taiwan after Beijing announced its plan to draft the national security law. Now, Beijing has revealed plans to promulgate laws to prevent, stop, and punish behaviors in Hong Kong that it deems a threat to national security. The laws will likely be inserted into the city's mini-constitution, bypassing the local legislature, 
in order to criminalize subversion, secession, foreign interference, and terrorism. The move has alarmed Democrats, civil society groups, and trade partners, as such laws have been used broadly to silence and punish dissidents in China. So I ask, what is the action of the United States? Well, on Wednesday, the same day, same week last, the United States Secretary of State, Mike, declared that Hong Kong no longer enjoys the autonomy promised by Beijing, stripping the financial hub of its special status under United States law. That's Mike Pompeo, I meant to say. And earlier in the day, the pro-democracy activist Joshua Wong of Demosisto told the Hong Kong Free Press that officials who push towards the national security law legislation will be targeted in American follow-up action. He so saying that now is the time for Beijing to realize that if they erode the uniqueness of Hong Kong, they will face lots of backfire, not only from Hong Kong's local community, but also from the global community. Uh, he's so adding that we urge United States President Trump and Secretary Mike Pompeo to execute the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act as soon as possible. European countries should also enhance sanction mechanisms under the framework of the Global Magnitsky Act. His colleague, Sonny Chung, added that limiting the capital flow of China's state-owned enterprises would exert pressure on Beijing. He so concluding that the fatal blow to the Communist Party would be to limit the capital flow, especially in terms of United States currency used by the state-owned companies in China. So, there's some positive news to take us to the evening. I'm going to promote Ben Astenius, uh, pass on my own solicitation and then uh, retreat into the gentle night. I definitely want to thank everyone uh, for their patience in our being able to start tonight, considering the challenges that we faced, of course. Uh, the fact that we made it on it all is, without a doubt, a miracle of religious proportions. There is no doubt we are divinely protected. Of course, I have my angels, and uh, they be men, such as Derek Talley, uh, they be women such as Lena Shea. Uh, they be, I'm sorry, to me he's always a boy. Young men like Brendan Zogit. And, of course, so many others that I should give credit onto. Now, one of the creepiest true crime tours in America is the Tucson Murders True Crime Tours. The Tucson Murders True Crime Tours provide us historic crime investigation into forgotten lost crimes in Tucson, Arizona. These small private tours are hosted by the Mr. Ben Baron Astenius, a true crime researcher and enthusiast who will personally take us thee to real historic crime locations related to these crimes in Tucson. Relive these events and hear the untold stories behind the stories. The Baron Ben specializes in the seemingly ever-developing case of the late serial rape killer Charles Howard Smitty Schmid Jr., alias the Pied Piper of Tucson, an aftermath tour. You can consult the unfinishedman.com website to read excerpts from his book, yet to be published, and see scenes from the film documentaries he's been working on. But other cases, such as the strange case of Morris Brady, the George, Dr. George Marvin Tejardine case, and the Red Rapist are also within his repertoire, as in fact are all the crimes that shocked the Southwest throughout the 1960s, the very decade I myself entered this veil of tears. These devastating crimes stained a city so deeply, they may never be removed. For tour information, contact the TucsonMurders.com. Tucson spelled Tucson, T-U-C-S-O-N, put the word the in front of it, or telephone the Baron Ben Astenius himself to guide your private tour at 1-520 forward slash 323-3406. Once again, that's 1520-323-3432. No, oh, zero six. Uh, let me say that again. Five two zero area code three two three three four zero six. I don't usually slur that badly. <laughs> now, of course, speaking itself is a struggle for me. And mind cuff, my struggle be thine own. Contribute to the struggle at douglasdietrich.com, where we now be accepting contributions via PayPal Holdings Incorporated on douglasdietrich.com. All due acknowledgement be unto our own personal hero, our dearest English brother in battle, the B-Team Thrax, 
Dietrichs or Dragons Ultimate Post Episodic Producer and our final productions archivist at DouglasDietrich.com, as well as the YouTube Maggot Channel Property Manager John Henry McMills Warrington. Subscribe to his channel at YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Maggot Tour, it being spelled M A G G O T A U R. Friend and follow he via his Facebook uh, timeline at facebook.com forward slash John dot war for word no for he nigh all videographic works of the internationally recognized renegade military historian would have been lost. And of course, he saved my virtual persona on the net more than once, uh, independently and of his own volition backing up nigh everything I've ever produced and saving it at a time when everything was scrubbed from the internet. Without him, we wouldn't have what we have in our archives on my website at douglasdietrich.com. In that sense, he's the bridge between the Akashic Records and the material plane of existence. Within the virtual plane of existence in cyberspace, as the fact that he saved my personality with which I interact with yourself in that realm, that matrix, in that sense, he's my creator. And, uh, and now you too can do your part to help in the fight against total annihilation. Spread the word about Douglas Dietrich, that he, the biological son of Adolf Adolphus Jacob Hitler, that he be alive and well and resident in the city and county of San Francisco. Find out more about my biological status as the son of Adolphus Jacob Hitler at douglasdietrich.com forward slash 2019 forward slash 05 forward slash 08 forward slash Douglas Dietrich, son of Adolf Hitler, fighting against white supremacist neo-Nazis. While you're there, confer, confer a footnote on my bio sire so that you can find out the meaning of my biological father's name and spread the word to all and sundry that the scion of Adolf Hitler is here to lead the world again into a greater age than the age of Antichrist into which the Allies have plunged you in darkness and despair and economic depression as well as psychological. Let it be known to all you know and ask them if at all possible to electronically relay their contributions, as I hope you relay your own, to DouglasDietrich.com. People are forever asking Renegades Humanis Arma Almaza Eruducio, the renegade human weapon of mass instruction, what they can do to fight the pedopathophilocracy, such being our present Slavo Western government by patriarchy of pathological pedophiles. You can all help spread awareness by supporting myself. We have a new contribution page on DouglasDietrich.com where you can make a donation online using either thy credit or debit card. Simply go to DouglasDietrich.com and click the red Donate button. All sponsors will be granted exclusive electronic access to both my videographic and audio recorded archives through to this year from the 2011th year in our Lord. The very year my own late and sainted matriarch, the Grand Ma Dame Diana Lin Zuchin, Takabayashi Hideko Dietrich was murdered, assassinated nigh immediately aftermath San Juichi Sensemi. The 311 terror attack against the Fukushima Daiichi or Big One cluster of nuclear power plant facilities on site the 7,000 Isles of the Greater Japanese Empire. When twas deemed by much Native American cosmological reckoning that the first rays of the dawning of the sixth world broke upon us and magics could again be worked conjointly with Mother Earth to redeem the folk upon her. They're not on YouTube anymore, where on the intra-global crises analyst Douglas Dwayne Dietrich long ago established his high-profile visibility platform for rationale or personal security by way of public promotion. Only on contribution will thy membership be processed within 48 through 72 hours between two to three days for full access to all mine archives, meaning all those videos that John Warrington saved aside those on the Maggot Douglas Dietrich channel and the YouTube channel named Taboo Bros 2, which is spelled T A B O O space B R O S space Roman numeral 2, as managed by mixed martial arts maestro Daniel Arola, whom you can visit at facebook.com forward slash Daniel dot Arola dot 3. 
of Damage, or D-A-M-A-G, Daniel Larola Martial Arts Group Incorporated, Cali Combatives. Optionally, mail either checks or money orders, never cash, to the personal residential address of the Mr. Douglas Dietrich, which itself be listed on douglasdietrich.com. The most important thing being that people regularly donate what they can within their means. Foremost among Axis Daddy D's donors, aside his lady and mistress Lena Shea herself, be our most beloved Greater British Brother in Battle, the Team Drax, Dietrichs or Dragons, heavyweight lifting keeper of the spirits, and YouTube Bizarre HD channel, our managing mixologist George Edward Knight, whom you can friend at facebook.com forward slash george.e.knight.7. Subscribe to his channel at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash bizarre HD, which be spelled B-I-Z-A-R-E-H-D. He being my own personal hero who has substantially delivered towards my salvation from the streets and whose self-produced videos entitled How the United States Won World War I and Why We Are Still Legally at War with the Third Reich both be factually substantiated per my own expositions. Indeed, the last Dietrich Gulvius, the son of Dietrich, or son of a dragon's, Anglo-corrupted as Dracula's expositions via YouTube would not be possible, sans generous benefactions from my listeners on a monthly basis. The Amerasian agent of the Peacock Angel, Tavush Maliak, be the only person on the surface of this world with the insider knowledge and experience necessary to lead thy resistance against the Russo-Sub-Satanic occupation, an anti-godly insurgency at bearing no end of emphasis that Judy, uh, Anglo-corrupted as Jedi, Literally, Master D, or the Master of Enlightenment myself, is not paid to articulate mine expositions and have never once been remunerated for my services rendered unto thyself and all thy holdest dear at incomparable sacrifices to myself, most tragically of all my loved ones, in my most singular and quite unenviable role as the ultimate public informant at personal risk, still at large. Your taxation cannot support me as I be denied access to the United States Department of Veterans Affairs benefits and or services do dishonorable discharge. So again, go to douglasdietrich.com and click donate. The very survival of the human species be at stake, and I am not exaggerating. Do not wait. Donate now. It be appreciated beyond my ability to express in any language. As well, forget not to subscribe to the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Douglas Dietrich and tap, click that notification bell in order to receive notifications that live streams has started. To re-emphasize, subscribe to the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Douglas Dietrich. Tune in at 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. That would be 8 p.m. in the Eastern Daylight Time Zone every Wednesday and Sunday night. And tap, click that notification bell in order to receive notifications that live streams has started. Subscribe and donate at douglasdietrich.com. Any and all sponsors will be granted exclusive access to the online archives, including all video and MP3 recordings of Douglas Dietrich from 2011 through to the present. Now, uh, let's check the live dashboard to see how long we've been on by now. I'm hoping we covered at least, well, it's three hours and 17 minutes. We haven't made it to four hours, but um, we did what we could. Uh, Jim Davis says, loved you, brother. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Uh, and Nathan Brooks says, be blessed, Doug and company. Love you. We love you too, Nathan Brooks and your family. Share our love with them. Your Mosey says, bless you all. God bless you too, uh, your Mosey. And uh, blessed be unto, unto you all who support me. And join us on Sunday night, and we'll go our usual length of time, more than likely. And uh, I want Derek Talley to sign off for us. Derek, um, I hope you have a wonderful personal New Year. We couldn't do this to this point without Derek leaving his phone on. It's Derek's phone maintaining us on Skype that is going to keep us pretty much ad hoc f running for the foreseeable future uh, at an audible level until I get a new computer. So I'm going to make it a point to try and get a new computer as soon as possible. But I hope, Derek, you'll be able to patiently work with me for as long as it takes before I get to the point where I can get a new computer tower. Um, I will probably, um, uh, you know, send the money to uh, Lena so she can order it online to be delivered to my home rather than, I mean, all the places are still very hard to access and 
I'm not really one who can drive easily. Uh, bef well, before you go um, and say goodnight to everyone, uh, tell us a bit about how you're going to get to your appointment um, on your birthday. Your father's driving you, or are you driving yourself? Oh, I'm driving myself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, when well my, well my dad was driving me, he had to come up and drive me doing chemo because they were giving me some pretty strong medications to go with my chemo. But um, just on regular appointment days, you know, I drive myself. I, I can't understand the painkiller bit. Um, both Brendan Zogit and I were really talking about how little your painkillers seem to work. And, and you were supposed to be on some kind of opioid or something like that, but you seem to be in terrible pain for a very long time. So what the fuck was going on that was... Why were your painkillers just not worth a shit? And why didn't you complain? Are you just taking it like a like a good Marine or something? Or, or are you... I guess, you know, well, you know, they gave me some oxycodone. And um, that's, that's about as harsh as it gets for me. So, you know, I just... I take it as the directions say, um, you know, once every four hours. There's days I go without taking it. But um, the, the problem is with my throat. Um, there's just, it just seems to be no, um, there just seems to be no rest, uh, no kind of relief for my throat. So I, I really have had no chance, you know, no choice but to just take it. Right, right. Yeah, to this day, it, it hurts. It hurts just as bad as it's hurting. Um, when it first started hurting and it, it yeah it hasn't gotten better one bit in my opinion oh my god i'm so sorry um hthrz wonderful human being sent us a rose and said still listening god bless uh he or she um whoever the person is whatever gender and uh so say good night to everyone and let them know you'll be back with us on sunday night as a matter of fact the show cannot function without you you essentially are my uh, executive producer at this point. <laughs> and, okay, uh, but you know what? Speaking of that, um, I got some new technology that I want to try out to where you can, uh, like your your as far as your your host, your your team Dietrich, we can all be on Skype. But then there's a there's a um, technology called Uber Conference that we can incorporate um, into there to where if you wanted to start taking phone calls, you could actually take phone calls that you know like. Um, like towards the end of the program or something, if you wanted to start taking in phone calls, and you could even get a customized uh, phone number um, to add to it, because it's a, it's free technology, but the free technology li uh, allows up to um, five people at a time, as long as you know, don't need five people at a time, um, you know, more than five people at a time to call in, that's fine. Other than that, uh, there's for seventeen dollars a month, it's uh, you can have like unlimited people call in but um it, it, yeah it's some new technology i want to uh try out with you here pretty soon that's fantastic i really appreciate that so we've done well um uh, brendan zogit is now the technical consultant and uh mr derek talley is now the executive producer we'll make it official uh we'll um make certain to inform uh my manager selena shea of such um uh, sarah shield says thank you so much derek for helping so much and uh, so uh, we all feel that, that same sentiment. Um, honestly, uh, d profoundly appreciate it beyond expression. Um, uh, the individual listening uh, who had the uh, HTHRZ uh, is uh, Heather. Uh, so uh, she's recognizable. And uh, well, um, I hope, honey, things are going well for you. And uh, with that, um, we have uh, getting nearer to the point of. Uh, three hours and 30 minutes into the program. This would uh, make the record as the shortest program, but I think uh, we got the message out we needed to get and certainly have given people a better sense of the context in which we're working. So um, my love for you, Derek, and my love for all our listeners, and I'm going to let Derek sign off for us. Say good night and then hang up, and uh, when you drop the call, I'll start streaming, okay? All right. Um, good good night, everyone. And I just want to uh, thank you for your thoughts and your prayers. And thank you for the support for Douglas Dietrich. And uh, thank you for listening to the Critical Omissions program. Uh, good night. Good night. Okay. With that.